Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My new neighbor demands I cut down my favorite tree. I live in my late grandparents' home. I've spent the last few years modernizing it and making it fit my style. There's one thing I haven't touched, however, and that's the apple tree in the back garden. My grandparents planted it on the day they moved into the house, and it came from my grandfather's family orchard as a sapling, a way of bringing a bit of his family with them. I love the tree, and some of my favorite memories as a kid are picking fruit from it or climbing up it when I was little. New neighbors recently moved in next door, and they keep complaining about the tree, wanting it cut down as it's casting shade onto their property where they want to put a hot tub. None of the tree overhangs onto their property at all, just sadly cuts off light in that one specific area. I've apologized, but told them I won't be cutting it down and suggested they put their hot tub somewhere else in the garden as it's a big space. I'd even planned to try and smooth things over when it grows fruit this year by bringing them a big bag of fresh apples. They are upset at me and complaining about how it's just a tree and it's not a big deal to cut it down. The husband has also been threatening to get lawyers involved to force me to cut it down. I'll admit, that part upset me and stopped any goodwill I had towards them or desire to smooth things over. I told them to do whatever they want, but warned them that I've got a camera in my back garden, so if they mess with my tree, I'll know. I set this up a few years ago due to the kids stealing all the apples. I don't mind giving apples away to people as it grows plenty, but I have an issue with people helping themselves. I know it's just a tree, and it's perhaps silly to be so enraged by their demands and threats, but it has sentimental value to me. Is it really that unreasonable for me to not care that it casts some shade into their garden? Edit. I've also explained the sentimental value this tree has, but they don't care and they don't see what the big deal is about the tree. Not the jerk. That's a part of your property that you love and cherish, and they knew the tree was there when they moved in, so clearly it wasn't a deal breaker for them. You can't always be a people pleaser. Protect your peace and protect your tree. That's what I was going to say. They knew it was there when they bought the house. Also, a lawyer can't do crap. It's your property. It's not even overhanging on theirs. I sat on a local committee, similar to an HOA, and had to look at shadowing diagrams for building approvals. Single trees were not considered at all in shading. The only time it could count is if it were creating a wall-like hedge. They're not going to have a case here, but these seem like people who will cut it down themselves and try to ignore the consequences. Not the jerk at all. I'd watch out for these people. It takes pushy people to move into a neighborhood and go to the house of someone who has lived there for years and demand that that person cut down an apple tree grown from a family orchard. OP. Yeah, I felt the same and I was worried they might try something when I'm not at home, which is why I warned them of the camera I set up so they know that it won't go unnoticed. If possible, cut a clone from grandpa's tree or actually cut a couple clones from it just to be safe. People bold enough to threaten legal action over your tree on your property that does not overhang onto their property can't be trusted. Even with cameras rolling, I could see them having it cut down while you're at work, regardless of the consequences. Totally not the jerk. And do a little bit of reading about tree law. Yes, disputes about trees are common enough that a body of law has developed around the issue. If they damage or cut down a tree on your property without your permission, that could be a very costly mistake for them. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you go ahead and cut down the tree for the new neighbors or not? Please let us know. I'd plant a few more is what I'd do. My fiance is extremely jealous of me spending time with my sister. So I'm 25, male, and my fiance is 24, female. She's never gotten along with my sister, who's 18. My fiance has never liked how close I am with my sister, and it's been a cause of a few arguments. I proposed to my fiance, Sarah, a few months ago, and things have been going smoothly. In fact, I would say our relationship has never been better. A few days ago, Sarah listed off to me all of the people she wanted as bridesmaids, and not surprisingly, my sister was not one of them. She said she was planning on asking them in a few more months to be in our wedding. 
Sarah then asked me if I knew who I wanted as groomsmen. I listed off a couple of friends that Sarah knew, Keegan, Joe, Sammy, etc. And then I said I wanted my sister to be one of my groomsmen. This made Sarah upset. She said that it wasn't traditional for a woman to be a groomsman and that it would embarrass her. I explained to her that my sister was one of the most important people in my life and she was going to be a part of our wedding. This made Sarah even more upset and she accused me of trying to ruin her wedding day and she locked herself in the bathroom. It's been a few days since this and we haven't spoken at all. Many of her family members have reached out to me and asked me to not include my sister in the wedding at all and that Sarah should be the most important woman in my life, not my sister. My mother-in-law even called me, telling me that I was making Sarah depressed and that I was a horrible person for doing this to my future wife. My sister heard about all of this and told me that it was okay to not invite her. I stood my ground and told all of them that my sister would be included no matter what. Am I the jerk for doing this? Edit. Sarah's dislike for my sister stems from one time that she saw us cuddling. That made Sarah upset. Second edit. My sister is aromantic and she told me that she would most likely never get married and that made her sad. I told her she could be a part of my wedding, even if it wasn't the same thing. I will never forget the look of joy on my sister's face. This is why I won't back down for those wondering. Third edit. I'm planning on calling off the engagement with Sarah when I get home from work. My sister is more important to me than any miserable marriage. I will be home around 8 Eastern, so look out for an update around then. Final edit. This is going to be a bit long, so please be patient with me. I got home from work and I told Sarah we need to talk. She agreed and we sat down in the living room. I started off by asking her why she had such a problem with my sister being a groomsman and also, as many of you suggested, if she had any sort of past issues related to that. Sarah told me she hadn't. She went on to say that having my sister as a groomsman was untraditional. She also said that she was uncomfortable with how close I was with my sister. I gave Sarah an ultimatum. We could go to couples therapy, she could try to repair her relationship with sister and tell her family to stop guilting me, or we were going to have to call off the engagement. Sarah blew up at me and said she was going to stay with her mother. Family-in-law is now completely upset with me and they're sending me mean messages on Facebook. So I guess that's most likely the end of Sarah and I. But to wrap things up on a good note, sister is planning on moving in with me. Her mental health was drained from this, so we decided to move in together. Thank you everyone for sticking through this with me. I appreciate all the kind messages. I ended up showing sister some of them and she was very delighted. Info. Why would you marry someone who's jealous of your sister? Absolutely not the jerk. You sound like a great big brother. I'm sorry you're going through this. OP. We had argued about it before, but it had been forgotten about until this instance. I will probably be calling off my engagement after reading everyone's advice. I'd also like to say, I really don't like the fact your fiancé said her wedding. Is she marrying herself? Because last I checked, it was your wedding too, and I don't see why she feels it's her right to ruin your wedding day. That's exactly what I thought when I read that line. I had a friend that was engaged and wanted every detail her way, regardless of what the groom thought. She tried to convince me to tell him that weddings are all about the bride and only the bride. She was not happy at all when I told her she was crazy, that it was his wedding too and that he should have equal say in their day. They never did get married. Not the jerk. No, it's not traditional for a sister to be a groomswoman just like it's not traditional for a brother to be a bridesman. But both are happening these days and it shouldn't be embarrassing at all. And if Sarah had merely been startled by this, then I would have said not the jerk. But for her to be having these ongoing, irrational, emotional reactions to the fact that your sister is important enough to you that you want her at your side as you marry your fiancé, that's a very different story. If she truly thinks that she should be the most important person in your life to the point that you exclude other people from standing by your side, that is an extraordinarily insecure and controlling person. I would be deeply concerned about spending your life with someone who thinks your sister should not be important to you. And I would also take note of who respects you and who wants you to be happy. Your sister already agreed to placate someone who doesn't even like her. She's doing that because she loves you. Your fiancé showing that she doesn't respect your wishes and puts her desire to be center of attention above your desire to be supported. And your future mother-in-law is supporting Sarah's temper tantrum rather than Sarah and is trying to help manipulate you into acquiescing. I would strongly recommend couples counseling before moving forward with the wedding process. Not the jerk. 
Her locking herself in a bathroom and not even trying to compromise is a red flag though. It's your wedding day too. Y'all are going to have to find ways to work around more in your actual marriage. Boss wouldn't let me come in one hour early, so I made sure she didn't get a raise. Background The police department that I worked for set a policy that patrol officers were evaluated based on their daily activity. Can't set quotas, etc. So an officer is compared to all of the officers working under the same sector sergeant. The stats are compiled each month. Basically, you had to be within 10% of the sector average. If your sector averaged 10 marks of activity per day, you could average as low as 9 or even as high as 11 and you were fine. Sector averages varied across geography and time of day. It was also pretty easy to stay within those parameters. My previous sector averaged 15 per day. Meet the goals and you get your yearly step increase, which is typically 5%. Miss those goals and you're a step behind your peers forever. This also translated to your overtime rate, which was a big portion of most officers' annual income. Let's say you're at $30 an hour and getting about 500 hours of overtime each year. That's about $62,000 base pay and another $22,000 in overtime for an annual salary of $84,900. Get your 5% step increase and the same amount of work will net you $65,000 in base, $23,000 in overtime, and an annual salary of $89,000. Miss your step increase and you're still making $84,000 while your peers are making $4,000 more. This also translates to similar gains in pension, 401k, 457k, and IRA contributions, yada, yada, yada. I received a hardship transfer to day shift due to my son staying with me for the summer. It was only for six weeks. The hardship was that if I didn't get the transfer, I would have to find childcare during the evening, which would have cost me about $5,000 for the six weeks. My lieutenant assures me that I will be put on the 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. shift as my wife works the 4 p.m. to 12 a.m. shift. This lets us trade off with my son and everyone is happy. Enter my new day shift sergeant. The sergeant was a slug, lazy, do-nothing supervisor, drawing a paycheck and only looking out for themselves. The sergeant put me on the 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. shift. I approached her and ran through my story and advised her I was told by the lieutenants that I would be on the 7 to 3 shift. She laughed at me and said, That's what babysitters are for. Okay, fine. Enter the malicious compliance. The sector average for this sergeant was 7. You could literally get a 7 before you left the parking lot for your patrol shift. It wasn't a difficult achievement. I started getting daily activity of about 60 to 70 marks. A mark was just a tally mark next to a category of work. I was basically doing more work than the entire section combined every single day. After a week of this, she comes to me and tells me I'm doing too much work, tells me that I'm destroying the sector average and it's going to wreck my review. She didn't mention that it also wrecks her review and all of the officers under her. I looked her dead in the eye and said, Well, Sergeant, I just have so much energy because I get to sleep an extra hour. I just have to do something with that energy or I will go crazy. I let that sink in for a moment and then add, If I had to get up earlier, like 5.30, to be here at 7 a.m., I probably wouldn't have very much energy since I wouldn't be getting as much sleep. I kept working at the same pace for the rest of the month, effectively destroying the sector's average to the point where she didn't get her raise. Side note, yes, I also did over all six officers that worked under her out of their raises too. Funny thing about slug sergeants, they attract slug officers. Her sector had a terrible reputation for not being worth a darn. I didn't feel bad one bit nor did anyone else that had to pick up their slack on the day shift. I got picked up for a special assignment after the first month and transferred to headquarters for about four years. My evaluation was based on entirely different metrics that year. I not only got my raise, but I got a promotion as well. Never mind the malicious compliance. What kind of targets are these that you can easily exceed them by 1000%? Talking to someone counts in most departments, community interaction. That sounds like when I used to do peer support. So it would be like, one, talking to someone about addiction, two, taking someone to the food pantry, three, researching side effects of meds with client, four, hosting a support group. So for a police officer, it would be, one, filing paperwork, two, following up with detectives, three, checking Facebook for stolen goods and known thieves, four, maintenance on car, something like that. I'm surprised she didn't get you transferred to a nice town in the country, maybe Sanford. I hear it usually comes with a nice cottage. You're not medically qualified. I work in a prison. 
and working in a prison means a responsibility to ensure the well-being of inmates. As expected, this includes medical needs. Anything you would see a doctor for, the inmates would as well. The procedure would be to send a medical kite or letter to medical with concerns, symptoms, etc. and request to be seen. For a true emergency, chest pains, troubles breathing, an inmate can declare a medical emergency. This is the equivalent of calling emergency services. When a medical emergency is requested, a radio call is made with the location, nature of the emergency, and the requested type of service needed, such as a faculty medical staff, custody staff, and outside medical services. When a medical emergency, or code, is called, the facility is locked down, meaning no movement for the inmates. Lunch being served? Sorry, you will have to wait to eat while this code is going on. Time for you to go to work? Sorry, you're going to lose some pay until this code is clear. As expected, there are incarcerated individuals that are not all that mentally stable. They will declare a medical emergency for a hurt toe or heartburn. Now, as a regular person, I'm aware that a hurt toe is not a medical emergency, so I, and many others, would advise the inmate to kite medical and request to be seen. This system seemed to work for a long time until the administration began to receive complaints from the inmates that staff were ignoring the request to declare medical emergencies. You are not medically trained, was the answer we received when we tried to explain the reason for ignoring medical emergencies. Do your job and declare the medical emergencies. Message received loud and clear. Over the next week, medical emergencies went from one a day to three to four a day. Inmate had a stubbed toe, medical emergency, couldn't go to the bathroom, medical emergency, they had an itch, medical emergency. You get the point. The facility was paralyzed. Medical was mad because they had to respond to every call. Food services were mad because a meal that took an hour to serve was now two to three hours. The inmates were mad because their yard and gym time was affected. A week later to the day, an email directive was received to stop declaring medical emergencies and to use our judgment. A few staff members kept it going for another week until it faded out. There was no sorry for the inconvenience or you were right, but that email was so satisfying to receive. Am I the jerk for not giving up my seat on the bus to a pregnant woman? A couple of months ago, I, 18 female, got into an accident where I was walking across the road and got hit by a car that was way over the speed limit. My right knee and leg basically took most of the impact. The car stopped and called an ambulance and left a phone number, and we later on settled it, and I got quite a big sum of money with help of my parents. A bone in my leg was broken, and my kneecap was basically fractured. Fast forward to now. My leg has been fine, as long as I'm not walking for too long, but my knee still hurts quite a bit, which results in me walking with a cane at 18 years old. I am a bit embarrassed by it, but I can't do much about it, so I just deal with it. Yesterday, after school, I got on the bus to go home. My knee had been bothering me all day, and I was happy to go home. Once I got on the bus, I took a seat as one does. A couple of stops later, a pregnant woman entered, and she looked around to see if there was a spot for her to sit, which there wasn't. I was one of the younger people, probably not the youngest though, on the bus, and therefore she decided that I was the perfect candidate to give up my seat. So she walked over and basically told me that I had to get up so she could sit down. She didn't ask me, she told me. So I tried to explain in a soft voice, not to attract much attention, but I have social anxiety, that I have a knee injury and that it's hard for me to keep my balance in the bus while standing and that it was hurting a lot. Well, this lady started yelling at me, saying that I was just making excuses and that she didn't believe me. So I showed her my knee and I showed her that I had scars. I admit that my scars don't exactly look pretty or are nicely healed or anything, but I had no interest in continuing this discussion. I made sure that no one else could see. The lady didn't know what to say and she just kept on sulking and went to someone else to get them to give up their seat. I thought that was that, but suddenly a person sitting behind me found it necessary to weigh in on the situation by saying that I was way out of line by showing my scars and that I embarrassed the woman and that I could have easily stood up and just dealt with it for the remainder of my route. So, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You're legitimately disabled and in need of a seat. If the person behind you was so supportive of the pregnant woman's need to sit down, then they should have offered their seat instead of trying to bully you into doing so. Also, giving up seats for pregnant people is a voluntary courtesy, not something a pregnant person simply gets to demand of whomever they choose. Why didn't that smug, judgmental jerk sitting directly behind you, who told you that you were out of line, give up their seat for her? They clearly heard and saw the entire exchange 
and didn't bother to volunteer. Edit. Just to clarify, I was not referring to priority seating. That exists where I live too. I'm talking about the fact that there was already a person with a disability sitting there, and pregnancy does not simply give someone universal power to oust anyone they choose from any seat they choose. As another young cane user due to a broken bone, not the jerk. A lot of people seem dumbfounded with how to respond when I point out my scar because it just doesn't dawn on them that there's a material reason I use a cane. I've learned to just say, I'm physically disabled, I cannot stand right now. If that doesn't work, I just ignore them and let them embarrass themselves. Why yes, I will walk out. About five years ago, I was working for a restaurant in a very busy area with an upstairs that led into a rooftop patio. The upstairs dining was constantly being used by the managers as a landing spot. They'd eat, have meetings, and generally mess up the area without cleaning up after themselves. The good thing was, this area wasn't used except for weekends. However, management would decide randomly to open the patio and upstairs, and then have to decide who would work those areas from the already strained staff downstairs. Tips were less because the kitchen and bar were on the first floor, orders took forever, and sometimes tickets didn't print. Everyone hated working it. The elevator took literally 5 minutes to move, so everything was done by the small spiral staircase. In addition to the dining area being a mess, the back of house was trashed upstairs from other servers as it was our overstock room. Because of all this, those chosen to work upstairs had about two hours worth of cleaning, setting up, transferring needed items from downstairs, setting up chairs and tables, then take it all down again to close, less time serving and making even less tips. I told my manager that I would work up there if she made sure that things were left how they were the night before, clean, and managers cleaned up after themselves and told her I'd complain loudly if things weren't clean. One day I came, and surprise, they're opening the dining room and patio, so I've been assigned. I worked a day job and got there around 5 p.m., which is when it starts to get a bit busy. I find everything trashed and tell my manager that it's unacceptable to expect me to start taking guests at 5.30 p.m. with no help setting up. My manager yells at me, You're always complaining, just stop. I wasn't a big confrontational person at the time, so I just walked away. She came to find me five minutes later and tells me, if you don't get rid of your attitude, you can just leave. As privileged as I was to have a nice day job, I was working this side job to have some fun money. So I smiled and said, sure thing. Took my apron off, clocked out, and had a great night off. The look on her face was priceless. They didn't open upstairs that night. Remember kids, people quit bad managers. Serving is serving but management of the place can make it or break it. Am I the jerk for not showing my ex proof that he wasn't my child's father until after he gave me his house? Okay, I know the title makes me look bad, but read the story for context first. I, 27 female, used to be in a long-term relationship with Tom, 34 male. We dated for two years before I moved into his house and agreed that I would pay for utilities while he covered the mortgage and taxes. After being together for four years, I discovered that he was cheated on me when I came home and he was with the other woman, when I came home from an out of town trip early. I was understandably angry, yelled at the both of them and tearfully packed up some things and stayed at a friend's house for a week. When I came back, the locks were changed and Tom had blocked me on everything. It took a court order to get me back in and by then he had already sold or thrown away a lot of my things to appease his new girlfriend and he knew that I didn't have enough money to fight him in court for all of it. I was really in a low place and to make myself feel better, I ended up hooking up with a friend, his name was Clark, 28 male, and ended up getting pregnant. I was already officially out of Tom's house when I found out and we were in zero contact, so I decided to test Clark first and he was the father. Since Clark was the father and I didn't see the point in telling Tom that I was pregnant and just started planning my life accordingly, Clark also inherited a nice house and insisted I live there to make things easier on my finances as well as give us both equal access to our kid. While I was out baby shopping, I ran into Tom's sister. She was completely surprised at how visibly pregnant I was. I made a quick excuse to leave with a vague and fake promise that I'd be in contact later. It was really just an awkward way to get out of an uncomfortable situation politely. A few days later, my phone was blowing up with calls and texts from Tom asking me about the baby. I ignored him but then he showed up at my parents' home demanding to speak to me. Tom was convinced that I was pregnant with his kid and was going to blindside him with a court order for child support after the baby was born out of spite. 
It would also align with his planned promotion and he didn't want to be perceived as a deadbeat parent. The company he works at is big on morality. I told Tom to leave me and my family alone, but he wanted me to sign an NDA about anything that would happen between us in family court to protect his reputation. I told him that he wasn't the father, but he thought that I was lying now to blindside him later and offered me his house. He was going to get a new one to pay me for my silence. I agreed and when he was fully moved out, I mailed him the test results when Clark was tested. Tom now thinks that I was being a manipulative jerk, but it wasn't my fault he didn't believe me when I initially said he wasn't the father, so am I the jerk? Edit. Since there seems to be some confusion, even though I already wrote it, I'll say it again. I told Tom he wasn't the father after he started harassing my family, but he chose not to believe me. 2. Yes, my parents knew Clark was the father and even told Tom too. Tom just didn't believe us. Edit 3. Just because I keep seeing the same questions and comments. 1. Yes, I officially own the house. He signed the title over to me the same day I signed the NDA. 2. The NDA is in regards to me identifying him and talking about him on social media, calling his job, etc. Since I don't give his actual name, and this is a throwaway account, I felt comfortable coming here. 3. The house is a small, three-bedroom house that is now fully paid off. 4. Tom technically did ask for a DNA test, but I told him he'd have to wait until the baby was born and pay for it himself if he wanted one so badly. 5. Tom and I kept our finances separate, so I don't know nor care how he's going to manage after all of this. That took a turn I wasn't expecting. And reading all of that, not the jerk. Not the jerk. Hate that you got cheated on, but love the karma coming back to bite him. 100% no one's fault but his own. He was absolutely convinced that you were lying and plotting a way to do him over because that's how he thinks. It's his problem that he wouldn't believe you or your folks. Not the jerk, I think. Was this entirely ethical? Probably not. Did he have it coming? Kinda, yeah. You told him the truth and he chose not to believe you and threw a house your way to shut him up. You could have just showed him the test results, I guess, but he did kinda owe you after throwing out all your stuff, so forget him. Well, what do you think? Is OB the jerk or was Tom? Please let us know. That boy sounds like he needs some milk. Despite the will, Aunt Karen thinks my parents' property belongs to her. This happened almost five years ago, and I just got notice yesterday that my entitled Aunt Karen has passed, and I got a call from her husband asking me to attend the funeral next weekend, and I declined, as did my older brother, Mark, for purposes of this story. Karen was my mother's older sister, and she constantly interfered in my mother and her children's lives. She never liked my father, and always tried to tell my mother that she made a mistake by marrying him. She didn't like the name my parents picked out for my older brother and my great-grandmother passed the day before I was born. And when Karen found out they were going to name me after her, Karen freaked out and said she wanted to name her potential future kid that, so my mother couldn't use it. Then she tried to talk her out of it by saying it's too old-fashioned and kids would make fun of me, which they did, but for other reasons. She criticized both my brothers and my choice of friends and even complained when I started playing softball because proper ladies didn't play sports and if her daughter ever tried playing a sport she would have her removed from the team spoiler alert she never had kids the day after my 16th birthday my parents drove on a business trip down to california i live in idaho my dad said that when they got back he would drive me to the dmv to get my license he never did because on the drive to california they hit a patch of ice spun out crashed and passed away i was a wreck for some time after that I didn't even want to attend my high school graduation later because my parents wouldn't be there. Their will split everything evenly between my brother and I. At the funeral, my parents, who own their own business, production manager, Tim, was talking to my brother and my brother told him that in a couple weeks he would step in and take over and he was counting on Tim to run things smoothly until then and help him in taking it over and learning the ropes. I had no interest in the business other than it was a guaranteed summer job when I was growing up. So I stayed out of it and just collected profit checks until I sold my half to Mark and he continues to run the business to this day. Mark told Tim that he should assure the employees there that their jobs were safe and that no major changes would be made. Then one day, Aunt Karen showed up and began putting her stuff in my parents' office and when Tim confronted her about this, she said his services were no longer needed and he was fired. Tim called Mark up and Mark went down with the family attorney, some police, and the necessary paperwork and had her removed, while she said the place was now hers because it was her sister's, so now she was the owner. 
As long as I've known her, she's never had a steady job and has had three husbands, not counting the man who called me, never met him, and milked each one as much as she could get until she divorced him. The next day I was leaving for school. I walked, it was fairly close, about 10 minutes, and saw her car and a moving van parked outside. She said she was moving into her house and then said in a sickly sweet voice that for a reasonable rent, she would continue to allow me to stay there until I graduated high school. I went in and called my brother, and he again showed up with the family attorney, police, and all the paperwork and had her removed from the property. I was at school, so I didn't get to see what happened, but that night, Mark gave me a business card for a policeman who I assumed helped deal with all of this, and told me that if I ever saw Aunt Karen on or near the property, to call that number and report her immediately. Don't even try to confront her or give her a warning, just call. I do know that the movers charged her to move her stuff into the van, drive across town, get turned away, and drive back across town and move her stuff back into her apartment, which she hadn't given notice yet. I got scared to the point that I didn't like letting our dog into the backyard when I was at school. I used to put her out in the yard to let her play in the fenced backyard while I was in school. For a while, I just put her in the locked and closed garage and then cleaned up her messes when I got home in the afternoon. Eventually, Karen moved to Colorado, where I assume she met and married the man who called me and said that she had passed and he couldn't find anyone from her family to attend the funeral. I chose not to tell him about her and politely said, sorry for your loss, but I can't make it. From discussions with Mark, he basically told him the same thing. Outside of myself, Mark, and Mark's infant daughter, I don't think she has any living relatives. I still own the house. Mark gave me his half as part of the deal where I sold him my half of the business, but still sleep in my bedroom. I refuse to move into what was once my parents' bedroom, the master bedroom. I go to the local university, go Broncos, and still miss my parents and think about them every day, even though I'm 20, 21 in less than two weeks. Own a large home, have a lot of money in the bank. I would trade it all to have my parents back but I don't care about the how or why of Aunt Karen's passing. Thank you for reading and sorry for the length. My boss expects me to work overtime because I don't have kids. I, 18 female, started a new job a bit ago. For the most part, I really enjoy it. It's just difficult as I need time off about once a month for doctor's appointments that I absolutely can't miss. Recently, my manager has started keeping my department two hours later than usual to help with extra work. At first, this was okay. I didn't mind the extra money, but it started happening every day to the point where all I did was basically work, shower, and go to bed. I didn't have time for anything else. Yesterday I went to my manager and told her I'm happy to help with extra work sometimes, but I won't be staying every day. It's overtime, which I cannot legally be forced to do. She said this was okay and I thought that was that. Today she came to me and told me that she needed me to stay anyway, as there were people with families who needed to go home. I told her I also have a family I want to go home and see, and she told me she only meant people with kids. I told her I'm sorry, but I won't be staying later every day, and parents don't have some rightful claim to leave that I don't, just because they have kids. She told me that legally there was nothing she could do to force me, but that it would be extremely selfish of me to force these people to miss out on time with their kids and potentially pay more for babysitters and such. I told her again that I'm sorry, but that's not my problem and I also have a life outside of work that I want to live, as does everyone else. Mine just doesn't involve kids. She left it at that, but I've definitely been getting side-eyed by people who I know have kids, as I have overheard conversations on our line. Ultimately, I don't care. I'll still be staying to help about half the time, but I do need time for myself as well. Am I the jerk? Edit. I live in the United States. We don't have labor laws that benefit the worker over the corporation. Also, the time I need off for my monthly appointment is usually the last two or three hours of the day the appointment is on. I'm never taking a full day or multiple days off for them. Not the jerk. The best time to find a job is when you already have one. My dad used to tell me that all the time. He was right too. When you have a job, you get to be picky about your next job. The one you have now sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. They'd rather pay overtime for multiple people every day than hire additional staff? That's simply throwing away good money on wage expense. If I were in your shoes, I'd start looking for another position immediately. Oh, and you're right. While society generally does give parents a pass, they should not be entitled to it at the expense of other employees. Am I the jerk for renting out my husband's man cave? 
Since we moved into our house three years ago, my husband lives in his man cave. The walkout basement that he plays video games in mostly is a one bed, one bath with a small bar area that can serve as a kitchen. He only comes up for food, to prep for work or to sleep and it's been bothering me because he never helps with the housework or our two sons. But at least he goes to work so I let it go and leave him be. Five months ago he was laid off of his job and has been applying for another one in sales. Right now he's collecting unemployment and along with my teacher's salary it isn't enough to cover everything. My son, who's nine, has been playing guitar for four years and loves it, but his lessons and guitar are quite expensive, around $300 a month, and my other son does kickboxing, which is $170 a month. I didn't want them to have to give up their activities, so I looked for other ways to make money. My husband is very prideful and won't work a job beneath him. I've already tried to convince him to work a $16 per hour cashier job for our family friend and he refuses because it would be humiliating having friends see him work at a cash register at 37 years old. So I found that we could rent the basement out for $1,100 a month and it would allow my sons to stay with their activities. I told my husband who refused saying it was his space. I argued I didn't get a space and if he wanted to keep it, he should get a job while he's looking for another sales job. He got angry and told me it was his house and he won't allow it being rented out. We both put down payments down and we both make money in this house, but it's his house? I told him we are not making ends meet and he told me to cancel all unnecessary spending including our son's activities. I argued if he got a job or agreed to rent out the downstairs, they wouldn't have to and he said that wasn't his problem. I posted it onto Facebook just to see if anyone would be interested and a student reached out. She's a college student who wanted to rent and it was a perfect fit because she didn't have a pet and was going to be gone most of the day anyway. I said okay and went excited to my husband who was really upset, saying we aren't renting out his space. I was upset he wouldn't sacrifice anything for our sons when I'm working and raising them and he isn't working now but isn't doing anything to help. I told him I was moving out with our sons and I think he recognized I was serious and gave up and told me to do whatever I wanted. I moved his gaming stuff to our living room and the student moved in today. He's still upset that I undermined him and I feel kind of bad because I didn't want to make the decision without his agreement, but at the same time, I feel he was selfish to refuse to either get a job or give up his man cave for our sons to continue their activities and keep us from going into debt. Not the jerk. How does he justify that you don't have an area of the house and he essentially has a one bedroom apartment to hang out in? He should not have had a man cave to start with and after he's back working, I would keep renting it. OP. Men naturally are supposed to have man caves and all his friends have them. That's how he justified it. Men are also supposed to, at least help, support their families. My partner graded I-step tests while job hunting after he graduated with his degree. I supported the family, occasionally working two jobs while he was in college. That's the sort of crap you just do when you have a family. Not the jerk. I make $20 an hour now. I don't have kids, but I guarantee you if I had to work in fields beneath me, I would. That's utter BS. I don't understand people like this. When you need a job, you get one. I have zero sympathy for people who can work but choose not to because it's beneath them. That attitude is a slap in the face to the workers who have no choice but to work those jobs. Shaking my head. You make half of my monthly income just on the space alone. How childish. I'm an engineer, but a few years ago got laid off and was having trouble finding another job. Everyone wanted to interview, but not hire. Ended up having to take a job waiting tables, which I had never done in my life, but I did what I needed to do. Only lasted a couple of months and I was back in my field. Sometimes you just have to buckle down and do what you have to do, no matter how uncomfortable it might be. Not the jerk, OP. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. Sometimes you gotta kiss that man cave goodbye. I wonder how his tears tasted. I walked out of the restaurant because my girlfriend is a slob. I, 25 male, am dating a woman who's 24 named Allie. We moved in together five months ago and I really love her a lot. Allie just doesn't have great table manners. She eats noisily and sloppily. In a restaurant environment, usually this isn't too bad because of the natural ambient sound. In a quiet room, it's much more noticeable. I don't exactly like it, but usually I can tolerate it. However, when Allie eats pasta, she slurps her noodles so loudly that people from other tables look. It's completely mortifying to hear people murmur about her loud slurping all the time. 
I know this might be normal in some cultures, but where I'm from in the US, it looks really uncultured and bothers some people who are more sensitive to sounds. I've tried to teach her how to use a spoon to spin the pasta into a ball. Nope, she doesn't want to. I've tried to ask her to take smaller bites. Nope, that's how she eats pasta and that's how she'll always eat pasta. We've been to a local Italian restaurant half a dozen times and each time but one in a basically empty restaurant, she humiliated me with her loud slurpy eating. I know I shouldn't care what other people think, but I agree with the patrons. It's disgusting. People are trying to enjoy a meal. I finally got frustrated one day and told her that I wouldn't eat noodles with her in public anymore. She can eat alone or she can go with friends. I'll happily drive her to the restaurant, but I will not sit down with her. She kind of blew off my message with a, oh yeah, you're perfect, so I get it. And I thought that was that. Last night, Allie really wanted to go to our local Italian place again. I asked her if she would be ordering spaghetti. She rolled her eyes and said she'd get the lasagna. I agreed that was fine and we went out for the first time in a while. When the waitress came to take our order, Allie completely went back on her promise and ordered spaghetti. I told the waitress I wouldn't be needing anything, stood up and walked to our car. I relaxed in the car listening to a podcast until Allie came out a while later. She sat down and started giving me the silent treatment. When we got home, she yelled at me about embarrassing her, would not let me say a single word without shrieking over me and said that she's only interested in an apology. I refused and she went into another room to loudly talk smack about me to herself, intentionally so I could hear. I don't know if I went too far. You really want a girlfriend with the table manners of a 10 year old who cannot distinguish between what's acceptable in public versus private and won't change? Not the jerk, but it's a losing battle. Accept her or leave her. Actually, by 10, someone should know better. I've got a six and a half year old and she knows to not slurp spaghetti noodles and how to spin them around a fork. Is she perfect? No, but she's not 24. This woman is honestly behaving dreadfully and doesn't seem to care. So OP needs to determine if this is their hill to die on and break off the relationship. I have to go with not the jerk. If she's slurping loud enough to draw attention every time she has noodles, that's too much. And it's not like you're telling her that she's not allowed to eat noodles, just not at a restaurant with you. She can make spaghetti at home. Slurping is more acceptable in many Asian cultures. Take her to a local Japanese or Chinese place and she won't seem so out of place. Entitled mom insists I give her kid my computer. I'm a regular train rider, or at least I was when I was in high school. I would take the train from my hometown to the city my grandparents live in every long weekend or holiday, so I had my train routine down to a T. Delays were common, but that was part of the experience. On long rides like this, and noticing kids get restless, I would let them watch a movie or draw on the paint app with my computer. This ride was different though. Entitled Mom was another semi-regular and had a habit of verbally going off on the attendants. Entitled Mom sat across from me this ride and the entire time her son was being such a disruption and I just tried my best to ignore them since the Entitled Mom did nothing to settle him down. Like I said, I'd usually offer to help out by providing a distraction, but frankly, the kid was destructive and I didn't trust them. I also happened to be having a stroke of creative genius and was working on an original musical, getting more done in hours than I had in months. Unfortunately, at one point, Entitled Mom made eye contact with me and motioned for me to take my earbuds out. I did and I still don't fully understand how the conversation followed. Entitled Mom Do you think my son could watch a movie on your computer? I can't get him to calm down. She hadn't even tried, but okay. Me. Sorry, maybe in a bit, but I'm working right now. You've done it for the other kids. Me. I know, but I wasn't doing work then. And if you're okay with waiting, he can use it later, but not right now. She grumbled a bit about me being a lying teenager, but turned back to her phone. After a while, the brat came to me asking if he could use it and that entitled mom had said he could. He kept asking and I kept saying no. He kept being a little brat the rest of the time he was pestering me. Eventually, Entitled Mom tapped me on the shoulder. Me. Yes? He needs to use your computer. I cannot deal with him anymore. Me. Honestly, I don't want to let him use it at all now. You guys keep bothering me and distracting me from my work. It's summer. You don't have any work. Me. You don't know that. What do you think I've been doing since you guys got on? Working. I'm doing something important and you won't back off. I'll tell you if he can use it when I'm ready to let him. You can do it later. Me. No, I can't. Would it hurt you to just let him use it? Me. 
Yeah, if I let him use it now, just wait. Entitled Mom once again disgruntled, turned back to her seat and travel companion and started crap talking me again. Eventually, writer's block hit me again and I shut down my writing programs and moved my bag to under my seat and offered to let the son watch a movie. Apparently, I committed two crimes at this point. Despicable me was not good enough. Entitled Mom insisted that her son bring my computer into their seating area. And that was when my patience was through. Entitled Mom, What do you think you're doing? Me, Letting him watch a movie. The Brad, I don't want to watch Despicable Me. No, he needs to sit with us. She let him run around between cars unattended all day. But okay. Me, I mean, you're right there. You can still watch him. And I only have a few kids movies, and I thought this was better than Frozen or The Little Mermaid. I have a younger sister. She likes princesses. He sighed and just started watching, but Entitled Mom stood and grabbed my computer off the tray in front of her son, and I was livid, and I snatched my computer back. He has to sit with us. Me. Not with my computer, he doesn't. As she was losing it on me, I grabbed my bag and left to the window car. The amount of light gave me a headache, but I just vented to the attendant, who I knew well, and they vented back to me about her crappy behavior. He gave me a free hot chocolate and I tipped him $40 because I only had to deal with her for half her journey. He would have to deal with her for the rest of the long, long day. Apparently, she got banned a few months later for hitting one of the attendants after an eight-hour delay. Slowest mile of my life. Growing up, my siblings and I went to a private Baptist school. Our parents wanted to keep us from the world's evil influence. It did not work, as I'm sure 99% of people who attend those types of schools know what actually goes on in those environments. Anyway, once a year, we went to what was called Regional Student Convention, aka Regionals. This was a big fine arts competition between other schools like ours in the region. People from Arizona, New Mexico, Kansas, and Texas came to one spot, somewhat in the middle, to compete so that they could move on to International Student Convention, which is obviously for other schools around the world. Our school didn't go to internationals, but took regionals pretty seriously. There are over 100 fine arts categories you can sign up for. Our teachers required at least 7, but no more than 12, I believe. The categories included photography, acting, writing, color guard, some sports, singing, art, and track and field, to name a few. I would try my best to do the most allotted categories since my parents took the week of regionals off and liked to see us perform. I would do photography, sewing, research projects, multiple singing groups, some play type things, and I played on the volleyball team. All of these were picked because I wanted to do them. I wanted the week to be fun for myself and my family. One year, the teacher in charge decided to micromanage everything about this week. They decided they were going to tell everyone what they were doing instead of letting us pick ourselves. The teacher decided one sport activity was not enough and wanted me to sign up for a track and field event. I told them I did not want to, as I had done it in the past and did not win and ended up exhausted the whole rest of the day as I did not ever train at all for the event. Our school was a church building that they could convert to the school Sunday nights, so no grounds for such a thing. Track and field happened on Tuesday morning and then after lunch it was time to do singing competitions. It made for a miserable day for me. The teacher did not care and decided I would be running the timed one mile run. They could have easily made me do something less exhausting, like the 100 meter dash, but more people signed up for that than they did for the mile, so by their logic, we had a better chance at a medal. Most teachers that take students to these competitions want to receive a plaque of achievement for that category, so they try to get as many people to participate so the plaque can hang in the school hallway. The teacher did not care that I requested not to do this and told me, You will sign up for it. Even if you walk the whole mile, you will participate. I replied with, yes ma'am, and filled out the required paperwork. I'm sure you can see where this is going. The day of the competition comes and we are all warming up waiting for our events. The teachers are all there cheering us on as well as other students who were not competing. That part's fun, just hanging out with your friends. Our school did not take it too seriously. We didn't have any training or anything, so it was just a morning spent on the grass for us. After a while, it's time for the female mile and I was all smiles. The teacher asked if I was ready, and I replied, Are you ready? They had no idea what they were in for. I lined up with all my fellow competitors and waited for the sound to go off. Once off, I did a little jog, and of course, everyone rushed past me. Then I walked. I walked the entire mile. 
which if you don't know is four times around a track field. There was so much confusion and many people came up to me thinking I was hurt. I replied to them all, I'm fine, just doing what my teacher told me to, with a smile and a wave. The officials were confused. The other competitors were confused. Even my parents were confused. I turned what would have been a 10 to 20 minute event into a 35 minute event, which is a lot of time considering they could not start anything else till the female mile completed, so everything was at a standstill because of me. I eventually finished and my judge didn't even give me a completed time since it was so ridiculous. I did finish in 6th place since there were only 5 other competitors, so I still got a medal. Woohoo for me! When I tell you the principal of our school was mad, I mean if he was a cartoon, there would be steam coming out of his whole body. He was silently screaming at me, telling me how much I embarrassed him, the school, myself, and most importantly God. I very calmly explained, I only participated like my teacher told me to do. I know that nothing happened to the teacher for making me do the event, but I was never forced to sign up for anything I didn't want to again. Am I the jerk for not sharing my water with my boyfriend while on a hike? For context, I'm a college student and an avid hiker. My boyfriend, who I met on campus, is also a grad student pursuing a different field. We both live in the same city, but I have lived here for half of my life while my boyfriend moved here last August to pursue his degree. To put it plainly, we live in the desert. Spring just began and temperatures have already been hitting 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 Celsius. However, I've grown accustomed to the weather and take all the precautionary measures when going outside, especially to hike. My boyfriend is from the East Coast and also claims the title of an avid hiker. He caught the tail end of the summer and admitted to spending the majority of that time either at his apartment or at school. Because he never actually hiked in the heat, I reminded him to start drinking more water to prepare for the hotter days. For some reason, my comment had struck a chord with him and he became visibly upset. He said, I've been hiking before and I'm a former Eagle Scout. You don't need to condescend me about drinking water. I can survive in the wild. Hurt by his comment, I never brought up the topic of water again. Yesterday, we decided to finally do a longer hike in the mountains. He had done research and wanted to do one of the more popular hikes in the city. Now, I've done this hike before. I know how grueling it can be, especially in the heat. Because of a pre-scheduled Zoom meeting, I decided to meet my boyfriend at the trailhead. I arrived equipped with my day pack, three liter bladder, and some water bottles for good measure. He only had one 24 ounce water bottle and nothing else. Knowing how sensitive he is about water, I decide to not say anything. About three hours in, I notice his water bottle is empty. Since we aren't even at the peak, I spare the extra water bottles that I packed. Once we finally make it to the peak, I realize that the water bottles I gave him are empty as well. I think nothing of it and think that he's just gonna have to suffer in silence. The hike down is about two hours and I'm down to one liter of water left in my bladder. I know that this is enough to keep me hydrated and comfortable for the descent, but as soon as we set off, I feel the nozzle of the bladder get caught on something. Thinking it was getting stuck on fauna or a cactus, I turn around and to my surprise, I find my boyfriend trying to steal sips of my water. I'm instantly angry that he would try and steal my water after giving me so much grief about it. I snatch the nozzle out of his hand and retort, I thought Eagle Scouts could survive in the wild. He became angry and hiked ahead. By the time I got back to the trailhead, he had driven off. He hasn't texted me since the incident, and now I can't help but wonder if I'm the jerk. Not the jerk. You shared your water with him. You gave him your water bottles. And, based on your account, he didn't even ask for more water. He just tried to take it, presumably so he wouldn't have to directly admit that you had been right and he had been wrong about how much water is necessary for these trips. Right now, he's having a temper tantrum and sulking. Don't let that mislead you into thinking that you did anything wrong. He's upset because you were right and you pointed out his arrogance in a way he could not refute. Drop this man. Seriously. So childish of him. Not the jerk. I don't get the endangering his life BS people keep going on about. He drank 24 ounces plus 4 water bottles that were like 16 ounces each. He was not even close to dangerously dehydrated, just thirsty, which was entirely his fault. He failed to prepare and got upset with OP when she tried to tell him. He's not her kid, not her job to keep pestering him and making sure he has his crap together, and his life was never in danger. This could not have hurt him. And the snarky comment was fair. He tried to steal the rest of her water after drinking all her extra and boasting about how he could handle the hike without her advice. 
Am I the jerk for refusing to wait for my sisters to arrive, so they ended up missing the trip to Japan? In the time before lockdown, I, 26 female, planned a trip to Japan with my best friend, Kathy, and my two sisters, Rose and Amber. The issue came when I said, well, due to the airport being two hours away and traffic being hard to judge, I want to leave at 6 a.m. Kathy agreed with me. Rose and Amber said, no way. They wanted to leave at 9 a.m., get there at 11 a.m. for our 1 p.m. flight. I said we should just take two cars. This caused another argument because they wanted to ride together. I said this was not a discussion, either ride with us or take another car. They said they would ride with us. I said we leave at 6 a.m., so you have to be there ready to go. 6.10 and no sign of my sisters, so I call them. No answer. I try again. No answer, so we left. I get a text at 6.45 saying, we overslept, we are on our way. I texted them that we had left, we were headed to the airport. Amber asked if I could turn around. I said, we are halfway to the airport, no. They ended up saying they would meet us there and I thought nothing of it. We parked, went through TSA, got to the gate and when I checked my phone again, Amber said, we need you to come back, our car isn't starting, dad is already at work and cannot get back in time. I texted them that we were already at the gate, waiting to board in an hour. They said they could not afford the taxi to the airport and would get a later flight. They ended up canceling and staying home because there were no open flights for a few days. This has since caused a huge rift in our relationship. They feel like I was too harsh and should have waited until 7 a.m. for them to arrive. I told them I had been serious the whole time, had not said I would wait, and I was not going to miss out on a trip because they didn't want to wake up early. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You told them exactly what you would do and not do. Lack of planning on their part does not make an emergency on yours. This is on them. They were going on holiday but couldn't afford a taxi? Not good planners at all. Not my department. Once upon a time, I was part of the orders department. Our primary role was to enter orders. We didn't enter all the orders, just most of them. The rest were entered by the call center. As common with these stories, we get a new manager promoted from the call center who is inexperienced and gullible. Let's call her Patsy. The call center manager, Weasel, sees his opportunity, swoops in, and fast talks Patsy into making the orders department responsible for all orders with a, these orders aren't really the call center's department. I can't say I disagree with him, but neither Patsy nor Weasel realize the sheer logistical difficulty caused by suddenly dropping all this extra work on the orders department. I complained to Patsy, telling her that this is a bad idea. Unfortunately, Patsy still thinks like and has a loyalty to the call center and her former boss, Weasel. But the call center and the orders department have entirely different cultures. The call center sees lots of turnover with people rarely staying more than a couple years. The orders department sees very little turnover with some people staying a decade or longer. Also, the required call center skill set is smaller than the orders department. Patsy doesn't realize I'm a senior team member and coming from a group that experiences rapid turnover tells me, it's not the call center's job to enter orders. If you can't handle it, you should find a new job. Challenge accepted. Now I've been with the orders department about three times longer than Patsy has been with the entire company. The call center has been pulling this kind of garbage on the orders department for years and I can anticipate the approaching crap storm. This is a major coup for the call center compared to most of the shenanigans they've got up to in the past. So I quietly let HR know that I'm interested in a position in the call center. With Patsy's promotion, I know there's at least one opening, and like I said, the call center has a high turnover rate. Two weeks later, I have a new job in the call center, and crap is starting to fly in the orders department. And it's not as bad as I thought it would be, it's worse. Beyond the bulk of extra orders, over the past two weeks, Patsy has been making improvements to orders department processes at the suggestions of Weasel and the other department heads, who've decided to take advantage of the naive Patsy. Add in the fact that the orders department is starting to hemorrhage senior team members who have also seen the writing on the wall. Now Patsy has to unexpectedly fill a bunch of vacancies for a department that had a history of a low turnover rate. She doesn't know the job, so she doesn't know who to hire. The remaining senior members can't help because she won't listen to them and they're too busy being overworked and burnt out by all the extra work they have to do to cover the missing team members and they don't have the time to train the new people. The new hires come in but they don't stay because the orders department only looks like an entry-level position. 
so even more turnover and more senior team members leaving when they've had enough. Meanwhile, I now have it easy over in the call center. I'm full-time working from home now with a better shift, and unlike my colleagues in the orders department, I'm no longer considered an essential worker, so there's a lot less stress for me. The skill set needed for the call center is both smaller and simpler than the orders department, and I already had most of it from my time with the company. I'm underworked because all the orders that the call center were previously responsible for are being passed to the orders department. The call center turnover rate has dropped, so we're actually overstaffed. Oh, and I got a nice raise to boot. I'm the call center's new unofficial expert on how the orders are processed. Weasel, now my current boss, is getting worried. His protege, Patsy, is failing hard. He was the one leading the change to improve the orders department, so he can't back down without looking stupid. The call center and the orders department work closely, so upper management is encouraging him to pitch and help out. Patsy has begun to realize how Weasel had did her over, so is refusing to make any changes to the orders department unless she comes up with them. She's willing to accept Weasel's help on her terms. So Weasel has started asking us to shoulder the burden and help process orders. That is, unsurprisingly, not met with enthusiasm. No one wants to do extra work for no extra pay. As well, the call center team isn't trained on how to process the more complicated and esoteric orders. The orders department is down to two remaining senior team members who have that knowledge. Oh, and there's me. I can process the easy orders the call center was doing and quickly, and I have the skill set to crush the complicated and weird orders, and Weasel knows that I actually enjoyed working in the orders department. So, what do you say, Squid? Can you help out? Weasel asks, insincerity dripping from his words. I ponder his request. Well, Weasel, I think you're right. Being in the call center now, entering orders is not really my department anymore. Am I the jerk for refusing to stop putting out food for the ducks and geese in my neighborhood? I live in a northern climate and have always put out food for ducks and geese. I put out cracked corn, oats, and sometimes some veggie scraps from my cooking. I used to only do it during the winter when I know food can be scarce, but after a few years, I started having ducks and geese come to my yard during the spring looking for food, so I started putting stuff out for them year-round. There are no regulations regarding this in the city where I live, and for the most part, I haven't had any problem with neighbors, until recently. My next door neighbors, a family of four, are in the process of selling their house. The housing market where we live has been crazy so far this year, and houses are selling incredibly fast, and in many cases, for far more than the asking price. Except my neighbor's house has been on the market since before Christmas and still hasn't sold. Like the majority of houses in my neighborhood, it's an old 50s style rambler that is in need of some work and updating but it's not been sold yet and my neighbors are blaming me for it. They say that whenever they have a showing or an open house, my yard is filled with ducks and geese and it turns off potential buyers. They angrily demanded, not asked, that I stopped feeding the ducks and geese so that they can sell their home. I told them that their home not selling was not my problem and that I would continue to put out food for the ducks and geese like I always have. They threatened to call the city and the police and I told them to go ahead. Sure enough, I got a visit from the city and they asked some questions about the type of food I put out for the birds and asked me to prove that I was indeed putting out food suitable for them. They left satisfied with my answers and told me that I was doing nothing wrong according to the city regulations. Last weekend, my neighbors had another open house and as usual, my yard had a few ducks and geese in it. Less than usual as there are plenty of other food options available for them now, but maybe a dozen total birds. After the open house, the husband of the family came over and knocked on my door and started yelling at me that they had two potential buyers back out of deals directly because of me feeding the birds. He just kept yelling at me that it was my fault that they can't sell their house and that I'm the one obstacle keeping them from moving. I was very uncomfortable with how aggressive he seemed, so I told him that he needed to leave my property or I was going to call the cops. He left, but he called me a bunch of names as he walked away and the whole encounter left me kind of rattled. I live alone, and feeding the birds is one of the few joys I have in my life. Am I the jerk for refusing to stop? Should I just stop until their house sells? My neighbor keeps going in my yard and playing with their kids without my permission. So my husband and I just bought our first home. Our sons are ages 1 and 2, and we were very excited to finally have a yard with a swing set for our boys and for our 10-year-old mini labradoodle to play. The problem is that the house didn't have a fence around the yard, so we planned on installing one in the spring since we just moved in during the winter. 
We also were excited to live in a neighborhood with other families so that we could all make potential friends in the neighborhood. When we moved in, not a single neighbor greeted us or welcomed us to the neighborhood. We didn't care at the time, but I feel like it should be mentioned now. Also, right behind our backyard, literally 15 feet, so close that it looks like it's touching our yard, is the back of an elementary school with a huge, new and gorgeous public playground. Yesterday, my husband and I heard screaming from our yard and noticed two kids and a large man were playing in our yard on and around our swing set. We had no clue who these people were in our yard, and after a long bit of time passed, we were confused why they thought it was alright to be on our property for so long without knowing us whatsoever or asking permission. We take our kids outside every day. It's nice out, so we put on our jackets and shoes to go out and speak with the random kids and the man, but they had left. Today, we see the same kids and a woman outside playing in our yard. My husband takes our dog outside to walk him and goes to speak with the woman. She tells him that she just moved from South Carolina and is the daughter-in-law of the woman who owns the house next to ours and that her husband and kids would be staying there for a while. She said her husband grew up in the house and lived there his entire life. She says that her husband asked the previous owners of our house if they could play in our yard and they told them that they could. In my head, I'm like, well, why does that matter if you knew that there are new owners here, which they do. My husband explains politely that we do not feel comfortable with them playing in our yard because they did so without asking us first and because if anything happens to them while they're on our property, we would be liable in any type of lawsuit. My father is a lawyer, so we were taught all the laws around homeowning. My husband came inside after saying goodbye and she left with her kids soon after. Next, her husband arrives home from work while my husband is going to the store. He immediately takes his kids into our backyard and plays the entire time my husband is gone. My husband comes home from the store and the neighbors leave our yard. My husband goes to take the trash out and the neighbors come back into our yard to our swing set with a large dog on a leash. My husband, not expecting another confrontation just taking out the trash in his yard, walks up to the neighbor father and again explains that we do not feel comfortable with them playing on our property, yada yada yada. My husband also says twice in the conversation that the giant public playground is literally right behind our homes. The man says that his son is autistic as if this is an excuse of why he takes him into our yard and not the public playground. In my head, I'm thinking, well, sir, my son is autistic too and loves water, like is totally obsessed with it. But my husband and I do not take him into our neighbors, especially someone we have never met or taken the time to say hello to, pools without asking permission. My husband tells him that our son is autistic too and it doesn't mean they can come with their giant dog on our property without permission. My husband comes inside thinking he got his point across and that the man would leave. But no, our neighbors decided after the second conversation to spend the next four hours in our backyard, going in and out of their house then back into our yard as if it was their own. My husband and I do not know what to do in this situation so humbly ask the opinion of the public. Honestly, if our neighbors would have introduced themselves and asked if they could play in our yard from the start, everything would have been a lot different. The reason my husband and I are so upset is because they played in our yard for long periods of time without knowing us or asking first. Then, after we nicely said we feel uncomfortable, they acted entitled to our property and playset, basically just ignored our existence, brought their huge scary looking dog with them, and seemed to think that we were outrageously in the wrong for not thinking it was okay for them to hang out in our yard without asking. We did not go out a third time, honestly, because we do not know what the right thing to do here is. I know that legally they're in the wrong. They are trespassing on our property and should not be doing so. I personally would feel so weird as a mother taking my kids into someone else's yard to play without asking. My head would be racing because it would feel like a crime because technically it is. But if these neighbors are so insistent that what they did was perfectly fine and that my husband and I are the jerks basically, then is there some human decency, right versus wrong, common knowledge that I am unequipped with? Is it okay to play with your kids in your neighbor's yard on your neighbor's playset if you have never met your neighbor and made zero attempt of doing so or asking permission to use their property? Update. I just went to walk my dog and the neighbor was in my yard again with his kids and his big scary dog. His dog immediately started barking and growling towards my dog as my dog did his business. I thought to myself, why should my dog, who is still getting used to his new yard, have a stranger and his giant dog, four times the size of mine, just chilling in our yard? So I put my phone on record in my pocket and walked towards them with my dog. 
The entire time, his dog was freaking out as we approached them, so I stayed about 10 feet away and said, Hi. The man didn't look at me. He just held both his hands on his dog and looked annoyed that I was interrupting them in my backyard. I said my name and that I was the homeowner, and he still did not look at me. I asked nicely if they would stop trespassing in our yard. The man just said, yeah. So I said, thank you, we would really appreciate it. At that point, his dog lunged at mine and my dog pulled away and managed to pull his head out of his collar. The man's dog went for my dog, so the man grabbed his dog with both hands and I scooped up and held my 25 pound Labradoodle. I said that this was one of the many reasons why they should not be trespassing in our yard with their giant dog. The man said, I heard you the first time and I walked towards my home to get my dog inside. At this point, I'm highly regretting taking him out there to begin with. Dog mom fail. But then again, it is my own backyard. I'm also thinking, dude, you clearly didn't hear us the first time because this is the third time. Once I got inside, I looked out the window and they left my yard. I have the recording of our conversation just in case anything else happens. Call your local police station and ask what the process there is to have them officially trespassed. At a previous home, I had to give the man a verbal, you are not welcome here. After that, he could be ticketed and arrested. You and your husband need to stop being so passive. You don't have to worry about upsetting the neighborhood because they ignore you and your family but love your property. Place serious, no trespassing signs in your yard. Call your local law enforcement agency for your area and discuss the situation with them. Create a timeline from the first incident to the last with details. Take pics with cell phone until you have security cameras installed. Know where your offending neighbors live, so future trespassing warrants can be issued if it comes to that. I would also talk to your local animal control agency and make an incident when the other dog tried to attack your dog. I would draw a very hard line in the sand. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or their neighbor? Please let us know. If you let entitled people walk all over you, they'll never stop. My daughter, who's 25, is obsessed with a blanket. I finally gave her a piece of my mind. I'll try and keep this short. I, 50, have a daughter who's 25. Recently, her boyfriend, who's 27, knitted her a blanket with her name knitted on it, and it doesn't look the best. But for some reason, my daughter loves it, and whenever I'm visiting her apartment, she almost always has it on her when she's sitting on her couch or bed. It does get really cold where we live, but the extent to which she likes this blanket is odd, as if she's a kid who's obsessed with a stuffed animal or a toy. I recently asked her about it and she said she likes it because her boyfriend made it and it reminds her of him since they don't live together yet and is extremely large on her so it's comfortable. I told her that she was acting like a kid. She said that she wasn't. I repeated that she was definitely acting like a kid and I found it weird. She told me she had no idea why I would find it weird and told me to leave her alone. I told her she was being infantilized and it was disgusting. She said that she would kick me out of her apartment if I didn't stop arguing with her, so I remained quiet. I'm starting to think I may be the jerk for accusing her and her boyfriend of such things. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. Normally, I would offer at least a brief explanation as to why I voted that way, but you just upset me. I've seen a lot of crap on this subreddit over the past few days since I started looking at it, but this is by far the craziest that I've seen. You really want a problem with your daughter over liking something her boyfriend made for her? Really? It doesn't matter that it doesn't look like a masterpiece. He made it for her and it's special to her. It must be really sad being you. No one has ever put any effort into making you anything. That's probably for the best. Because you wouldn't appreciate it anyway. Get out of here. You're the jerk. Of course you are. She's fond of a handmade gift her boyfriend gave her. There's nothing the slightest bit weird or childish about that. I'm guessing no romantic partner ever spent hours and hours making something just for you. If they had, you would understand why your daughter cherishes this blanket even though it's not the most perfect blanket ever made. It probably took weeks to make that blanket. Someone spending that much time and effort making me something is the most special thing I can imagine. I've never had a romantic partner do that for me, but family members have and gifts like that just have a way of making you feel so completely loved and appreciated. Of course she is attached to it and wears it all the time. Not only is it extremely practical in a cold climate, it's a physical representation of how much he loves her. You're the jerk. So you can't understand why she would really like a handmade gift her boyfriend made her? Seriously? I like having a blanket on my lap when sitting down too. I find it comforting. The only one who acted like a child here is you for even being so rude of bringing it up at her own place. Well, who do you think is the jerk? 
OP or her daughter? Please let us know. Never tell the people of Reddit that adults don't need to snuggle up with blankies. Most of the people on there are probably snuggling up with their blankies right now. Am I the jerk for asking for normal updates for my wife? I just want to make sure she's safe. My wife and I have known each other for 20 years, dated for 7, been married for 2. We have a 16-month-old daughter together and a great marriage, generally speaking. As long as we have known each other, we trust each other without exception regarding serious things or any type of serious, life-altering bad decision that can happen to a married couple. We have silly, bickering-type disagreements, like I think most couples do, but there is never yelling, as neither of us grew up in a home where that thing was common, and we prefer to talk about what went wrong and come to a mutual agreement as to how to keep it from happening again. Anyways, there is this one issue that has been a recurring disagreement between us that I'm wondering if I'm being unreasonable and should just let it go, being the jerk for being frustrated when it happens, or if I'm justified in asking for it. The wife grew up in a home where once of age she was allowed to go out with friends, come home whenever, and her parents did not expect any updates of any kind. I grew up with parents that also let me go out, but they wanted updates about where I was, who I was with, and when they could expect me to be home. Now, I can't get updates about anything from her as my spouse. I've told her time and time again that she can do whatever she wants, when she wants, and come home whenever she wants. I'm your husband, not your boss. All I want to know is where you are and when you think you'll be home. And when there's a chance, please let me know so I'm not at home worrying about you. But it doesn't happen. Today, she left town while I was at work, plans I was well aware of far in advance. But she did not tell me, Okay, honey, I'm getting on the road. Love you. I'll let you know when I'm there safe. She just left town and said nothing. And likely would not have said anything when she arrived. I say I deserve these minor updates. She says, you knew I was leaving town days ago. So why do I have to tell you again when I actually go? An important part of this rant worth noting is that I'm an ex-911 operator slash police dispatcher. And I did that job for 10 years. I've heard the worst of things and know how bad it can get. So from that, anxiety stems my desire to know she's okay. We can track each other's locations through our phones for safety reasons, and we have always been able to. But again, that's not for lack of trust, it's for safety concerns. God forbid something could happen. Short of me using it to meet her outside with the baby because she gets excited when mommy gets home, it's not something I ever check. Thanks for your help. Not the jerk. You both have different ways of operating. She's very independent and not used to reporting to anyone. You did slash do the check-in thing. I do think that it would be courteous to say, I'm leaving on a road trip and to let you know of arrival. Don't think it is required though to advise when one is going to the grocery store type of trip. You two need to discuss and come to an agreement, which will likely require compromises on both sides. This needs a lot of upvotes. I'm extremely independent and live alone. So when people ask me to check in, it feels infantilizing because I'm an adult woman who has lived alone in a major city for six years. I can take care of myself. I don't have to do it on a regular basis, so why would I do it the few times a year when I'm around family? A lot of adult men and women who can take care of themselves and who live alone are still attacked every single day. It's not infantilizing to want to ensure someone you care about is safe. Not the jerk. I wouldn't necessarily say you're being unreasonable, but I do think you should ease up on expecting unsolicited updates. If you know she's leaving town, do you text her, hey, let me know when you leave or get there safe? I'm in a relationship with uneven habits like this and my partner is just not wired to give that kind of feedback. If I ask after it, I almost always receive an answer though, because they're considerate. If she just ignores you, that's another story. Not the jerk. Part of marriage is learning to understand and accommodate another person's communication style and needs. And what you're expecting for is well within the realm of what she should be willing to do. Especially since you have a kid together. Letting the other person know where you are and when to expect you is common courtesy when you have childcare to coordinate. Obviously, she's not a monster, but she should be willing to meet you at minimum halfway there. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. If Reddit boy expected me to text him updates all the time, he'd need a new head. Why would I need updates? You never leave this room. How could you say that, Reddit boy? <laughs> Be in the conference room at the time meetings are scheduled to start. A couple decades ago, I was working as a network engineer for a consulting company. The company owner, Kim, was the best salesperson I've ever met, could sell ice to Eskimos. She had a temper, 
threw a shoe at me once, but great technical knowledge and knew when she didn't need something. After I'd been there a couple years, we got a new engineering manager. We all called him Jerk. Nice enough guy. It's just that around here, everyone named Richard is called Jerk. Normal company policy had always been that meetings would be announced over the intercom when they were ready to start. We had engineering meetings once a month, early morning. The next meeting was announced a little later than normal, but eventually it was announced and we all headed over. Jerk was not happy that few people were in the conference room at the time the meeting was scheduled to start. He made it crystal clear to us all that in the future, meetings would not be announced over the intercom and he expected us all to be in the conference room at the time meetings are scheduled to start. We all knew the reason for that rule was that the owner was never ready for a meeting to start at the scheduled time. We all knew the reason for that rule was that the owner was never ready for a meeting to start at the scheduled time. She was always running late or the previous meeting ran over, whatever. New manager flexing his authority and trying to whip us into shape with a dumb rule? Yeah, we didn't say anything. A few hours later, it's time for a meeting that actually includes the company owner. I head over to the conference room a few minutes early to find the door closed. I wait until meeting time, knock on the door, poke my head in, and ask if this was the customer meeting. The owner is like, what? No, you know we announce meetings over the intercom. Why would you think that this was the customer meeting? Me, our new engineering manager announced at the engineering meeting this morning that meetings would no longer be announced over the intercom and we were expected to be in the conference room at the time meetings are scheduled to start. I'm surprised his head didn't explode, the look she gave him. Kim, meetings will be announced over the intercom when they are ready to start. Me, okay, thank you. I close the door and leave. That was the one and only time he ever announced a new policy. I can do this all day. I worked in homes for disabled adults for over a decade. Every client had an ISP, individual service plan, and as a caregiver, it was our job to know what was outlined in each plan. Every year, the local baseball team hosts a night for the group homes. This was also when HR would come with any home that might need a hand. I got stuck with one of the most annoying HR people several years ago. Terry just thought she knew everything. She kept telling me I couldn't take photos of the clients. I could, we had photo permission. That one client didn't need their wheelchair to walk to the seating. They did, etc. We were seated next to another home that I used to be at, and so I helped those staff as needed, too. One client had in his plan that his socks, braces, and shoes only had to be worn in the van for safety reasons. We had worked hard with him to get him to that point. There was a lot of upset and punching involved, but we got there. Well, see, Terry thought she knew everything and insisted that this client had to have his footwear on. We kept trying to tell her that he wouldn't tolerate it. Her answer? Just do it. I'm right, you're wrong. Cue malicious compliance. Okay, bud, we have to put your footwear back on. And the other staff and I wrestled everything on. Not five minutes later, one shoe went sailing and landed next to Terry. Oh, bud, we can't throw our shoes. Next went the braces and the socks, which hit poor Terry in the back of the head. Soon after, while we were picking up those items, off came the other footwear, of which the shoe and the sock hit her head this time. Whoops, I know you don't like these, but we have to put them back on. Again, everything was taken off and launched. Every single thing hit Terry in the head again. I went to gather his things and said, I am so sorry, we will get these back on ASAP. She handed them back to me and said, Forget it. Obviously, the ISP needs to state that he can't have his footwear on. Let me make a note. She looks at his plan, looks at us, looks at it again. Oh, he only has to have them on in the van? Cackles. Am I the jerk for not cleaning before a cleaning service arrives? I, 27 female, am a mom of two, a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and recently became a single mother very unexpectedly. I've been struggling terribly keeping up with deep cleaning since I went from working a part-time job to that and an additional full-time job. I know a lot of people do that and more while also maintaining their household, but I wasn't prepared for it. I need time to adjust and I don't want my kids to notice the difference. My best friend, who knows I'm struggling, recommended her niece, who has just started her house cleaning business. So after some budgeting, I hired her to clean every other week. She does a deep clean of the entire house, with the exception of the kids' playroom, which I asked her not to worry about, so the kids can be occupied in there when we're home and she's cleaning. Ever since she started, though, she makes little comments about certain things not being part of her job. It's not always the same complaint. 
First, it was about wiping down my daughter's high chair. No food on it, told her not to worry about it in the future. Another time, it was my son leaving toothpaste in the sink. Today's complaint was about tub rings in the bathtub. She said she's not here to clean up after kids and would prefer I clean those areas on my own if I want her to continue working for me. I told her I'd figure it out. I've never hired someone else to clean my house before, so I have no idea if this is normal. I always thought you just make sure your stuff is put away and then you stay out of their way so they can get the job done. I already make sure the house is straightened up and I do clean in between, but am I the jerk for not doing more? Not the jerk. If I'm hiring someone to clean my house, including my bathrooms, but they're complaining about toothpaste in the sink and tub rings, I would be looking for a new cleaner. I can see not wanting to wipe down the high chair and OP said fair, don't do that, but the rest is exactly what they were hired for. Fire her and find a new cleaner who doesn't mind working, OP. Yep, it sounds like she doesn't want to do deep cleaning, only light cleaning. When I was cleaning houses as a side gig, tubs, sinks, and even the high chair would have all been part of a normal clean. Deep cleaning was stuff like cleaning baseboards, doing windows, and vacuuming the ceilings for cobwebs. Not the jerk. Those things are the definition of what she should be doing. The sink and the tub? Are you serious? I thought this was going to be like you're a hoarder or your kids' toys are everywhere. Hire someone else. OP. The kids' toys are definitely everywhere in the playroom. That's a big part of the reason why I never wanted her to bother with it though. I'm on a few waiting lists for other cleaning services, which I did before hiring her, but it looks like I might be on my own for now. Am I the jerk for being mad that someone revealed my pregnancy at a family gathering? My boyfriend, Lucas, 33 male, and I, female 32, learned that I was pregnant two weeks ago. I'm currently a little bit more than one and a half months pregnant. We were not trying and it was an accident, so we are a little lost. We are at a point in life where we consider the possibility of kids, but we never decided anything. Right now, the only people who know are some of our closest friends. I'm not going to lie, it has been some intense and stressful couple of weeks. Yesterday evening, we had a family gathering. It's my uncle's birthday this week, and so he and his wife rented a big house. We all went yesterday night, and we were supposed to stay until tomorrow. It was also the opportunity to have all the family and close friends reunited together. Yesterday night, we all had dinner together. It was a buffet, so everyone was standing and talking. The real meal was supposed to be today at noon. Lucas and I thought it would be a way to take our mind off things. Keep in mind that at this point, nobody at this event knew. So yesterday, we were all catching up when my cousin came to introduce his new girlfriend, Anna, to us. I see my cousin often, so we only talked a little. After a while, however, Anna came back to us and did not leave me alone. She kept talking to me, cutting other people off and trying to make me drink to have fun. I told her that I was not a drinker, which is true, especially at family gatherings, and I tried to make her understand that I wanted to talk to other people. At one point, Lucas got fed up and went outside. She again tried to give me a drink, and this time when I told her no, she asked in a teasing manner if I was pregnant. I froze up, and before I could say something to her, she started telling me that she was happy for me. I told her nobody knew, and her answer was, OMG, this is such a good opportunity to tell your family. And then she made a toast and told everyone. Everything happened so quickly that I couldn't stop her. Everyone came to congratulate me, and I started getting overwhelmed and cried. My cousin went to get Lucas, who came for me, and we left to go to our rooms. A lot of people tried to follow us, but he explained that we needed some time. Later, he went out and told people that we didn't want everyone to know yet. They left us alone for the rest of the night. This morning, we went for breakfast, and a lot of family members called me dramatic for leaving the night before. I tried to explain that Anna had no right to tell people and that we didn't want people to know. They got mad at us, saying that at one point or another, they would have known, that I should not have kept it a secret and that I should be thankful for Anna so that we could all celebrate. We lost it and went home. My family kept calling and texting us. They said that we overreacted and that we spoiled the good news and ruined it for everyone. Not the jerk. As a non-drinker, I can say right now that Anna was already the jerk for not respecting the fact that you don't drink and just leaving it at that. People like that are so annoying. This is entirely her fault. She should have respected your boundaries from the beginning, but she didn't. You deserve an apology from her. Am I the jerk for getting more expensive gifts for my friend than I do for my girlfriend? My best friend of seven years has a very expensive taste. I've always bought her fancy and luxurious gifts, 
and she's the happiest when I do so. No, I never wanted to date her or she to date me. It's just a thing we did, and we were always close platonically. I'd do the same for my male friends as well if they had expensive taste. My girlfriend of two years never showed or implies she had expensive taste, so I just bought her some regular things because I knew she'd be happy and grateful either way. I didn't have to break the bank to make her happy, and I really love her for that. But recently, she raised a concern to me about how it seems very weird and dismissive and favoritism, how I put so much effort into my best friend's gifts than I put into hers. She said she's feeling I favor my best friend over her because I put more thought and more research into getting her the perfect gift, while to my girlfriend, she assumes I just get the first thing I see just to be done with it. I explained to her that I buy her more random gifts because I know she doesn't prefer something specific and she'd be grateful even if I gifted her chocolate. She told me that's the problem and that I never even thought of putting effort for her and that I'm simply not paying attention. It never occurred to me that way. Apparently, she's been trying to speak about this, but she claims I never get it and she feels like I ignore her on purpose and favor my girl best friend over her. Am I the jerk? So, because your friend is a superficial person that only likes expensive things, you reward her by taking a lot of time and care thinking about what to gift her and spend a lot of resources. And because your girlfriend appreciates more the thought behind the present and is not so worried about the price, you punish her by not thinking much about what you give her and also get her something cheap because you like she doesn't make you break the bank. I hope the way I just expressed this makes it clear to you how she feels about this situation. You don't have to spend gazillions on the presents for your girlfriend, but you do need to be thoughtful because she is a nice person that actually cares about the thought behind the present more than the present. You're the jerk. You're the jerk. How does less expensive taste translate to it's okay not to make any effort to put any thought in gifts for her? Of course you're the jerk. If you have the money, then that's fine. Do what you want with your own money. But seems like you put your friend's wants and needs over your girlfriend just because your girlfriend isn't materialistic. She'd probably appreciate effort and memories over gifts. Just because your friend has expensive tastes, that doesn't mean you have to fund that. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. I'd love to be his friend. Maybe he'll buy me expensive stuff too. Karen's sister demands I buy better presents for her kids. I'm a 23-year-old female with two young nephews. I enjoy reading. I have a home office slash library that has half the room as bookshelves filled with books of all kinds, from school textbooks and research books to fantasy and kids books. I admit I am a bookworm. Anyway, my nephews have started reading a lot more, so I decided to buy them some of my favorite books to read as a kid. Books like The Magic Treehouse, Geronimo Stilton, and The Enchanted Castle, etc. When I went over to give them the books, my nephews looked at them for a few minutes then threw them down on the ground. We were outside on the back porch. My nephew started asking what else I brought for them and why I gave them smelly, boring old books. The books were brand new, still had the stickers on and everything. I thought maybe they were just being kids because, you know, they're kids. But when I explained I just brought the books for them, they threw a huge tantrum. They were screaming and crying about why I didn't buy them video games and toys instead and just gave them stupid books. They started stomping all over the books on the ground. Their mother, slash my sister, did not stop them. In fact, she scolded me for not getting them something they really wanted, like video games. I started arguing with her that she had told me that they loved books and they wanted to read more, so that's why I got them the books. I thought they would enjoy these books as I did as a kid. My sister screamed at me about being self-absorbed and how not everyone loved books like I did. But she was the one who told me that my nephews really loved books like I did, repeatedly. I knew I was getting nowhere with this argument and my nephews screaming in the background, so I picked up all of the books off the ground and left to go back home. Within the next few days, my sister repeatedly called to berate me and yelled at me for not getting them something else. Then after a week, my sister called to ask if I was getting my nephews anything better because they were so disappointed and upset. I told her no. She yelled at me some more. Before she hung up, she asked when I was going to bring over the books again or if she needed to come get them. I told her no and that I was keeping them because she and my nephews were being ungrateful and entitled. I told her that she should teach her kids better, not to be spoiled brats and to be appreciative of any gift that someone gives them, regardless of if they like it or not. 
Like I said, I enjoyed these books as a kid and would love to reread them as much as I can. So I decided to keep them for myself because my nephews didn't want them to begin with and were being entitled brats. So am I the jerk for keeping the kids books I bought for my nephews? Edit. My sister has raised my nephews to be spoiled rotten. If they don't get their way, they will be little monsters to you or others and my sister encourages their selfishness and bad behavior. One of the reasons I am low contact with her right now. For the people that are asking for my nephew's ages, one is 7 years old and the other is 2 years old. I mostly got the books for the 7 year old but thought maybe he or my sister could read them to the 2 year old, like bonding time or something. And yes, both play video games. My sister bought each a small handheld kid iPad or whatever it's called, I'm not sure. I didn't even know that such a thing existed until my nephews were a little over 1 year old. They both were taught how to use them as well as YouTube, kids TV channels, and Game Boys. I've ranted about kids using technology in another sub before. When I was a kid, we played outside. My 7 year old nephew knew how to use basic internet slash computers at the age of 2. Now my 2 year old nephew does as well. I believe today's parents rely way too heavily on technology to entertain slash keep their kids busy, but that's just my opinion based on my experience with my nephews. I let a 9 hour long baby cry loop from YouTube run on my sound system on max volume to teach my neighbors a lesson. So I wasn't at home, obviously, during the night shift since I was at work. Before I left, I set up a baby cry loop from YouTube on my Bose sound speakers on max volume and kept it running the entire night. I have sleepless nights since October of 2021 because of their baby. I tried talking to them, but they seem to be really ignorant parents. Sometimes their baby cries for 4 to 5 hours without a break. I will probably soon report to the police because to me that doesn't seem normal. I'm only 23, male, without a kid, but even my girlfriend said this can't be normal. Also, P.S. I made sure that nobody else is affected by it. I only have one neighbor right now because the other two rooms are being sanitized. Also, sorry for the rather bad English. Edit. I figured since this gets more comments than I expected, I would edit this post quickly. Yes, I now see that what I did was stupid and wrong, but I will apologize to them. But what the heck, seriously. I get that most replies are, you're the jerk, but what's shocking to me is that most comments indicate that everyone has to just accept getting their sleep schedule absolutely ruined, and not just my sleep schedule, as I mentioned I am sleep deprived for over half a year now. I cannot concentrate on university or on my private life, as well as I did before all of this. People are asking me if I'm depressed or if something is wrong with me, and all of that just because of another person's infant. I shouldn't pay with my education nor my social life. And to the people who suggest I just move out or move into a house if I can't deal with crying babies, yeah, I'm sure everyone my age being a student has that possibility. So yeah, my action was stupid and I am 100% going to apologize. However, just because you now have a baby doesn't mean that literally no rules apply to you anymore. I have a right to live a healthy life as well and sleep is an important part of a healthy life, especially long term. It's shocking to me that I, in my age, have to write this to a lot of people who raised kids, looking at 85% of the comments. Edit 2. Yes, I do work night shifts, but I'm a full-time student. My faculty is a full-time studies, there's not much room left for work. Just to clear that up, I do not work 5 8-hour night shifts as some thought here. Sorry for not being clear. You're the jerk. Imagine having a baby who you love more than anything you could have ever imagined and would do absolutely anything for. Now imagine that baby is sick and in so much pain that it cries constantly and all you can do is hold it and cry along with it. You're sleep deprived, you feel like you're failing, and you just know that on top of how awful you feel for being unable to help your baby, that your neighbors have to listen to it too and are probably judging you and thinking you're a bad parent. Now imagine your jerk neighbor deciding to pile on to your already miserable existence and preventing you and your baby from getting any sleep at all. One more time, you're the jerk. And on behalf of your neighbors and parents everywhere, a heartfelt forget you. This, I remember my first kid. She had an allergy to milk and I didn't know. I would spend hours holding her while she screamed and I would silently cry along with her because I was desperate and I didn't know how to make her feel better. The impact on my mental health was so much. Fellow milk allergy mom here, it's the worst. I was absolutely distraught because we did everything we could think of and she was still just so miserable. My husband and I would just sit and cry with her. 
We only found out because we were so sleep deprived that my husband accidentally grabbed soy formula instead of regular and she was a totally different baby. If you work the night shift, you can't even be mad that people are up making noise during the day. But you can get in trouble for being loud during quiet hours. You're the jerk. Right? Like I work night shifts too and yeah it sucks if you need to sleep and everyone around you is awake and busy and with that also loud but that's just something you have to deal with. Sure we can be courteous to each other. My downstairs neighbor once came up and asked me politely if I would mind turning my music down since she tried to sleep for the night shift. Sure I did but the difference is you can't just turn a baby down. It's not like the parents enjoy it when the baby cries or sleep. Well what do you think? Is OP the jerk for blaring that sound all night or not? Please let us know. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Whee. Would I be the jerk for calling the police on my boyfriend after he let his brother and his family live in my holiday home without my permission? For context, I, 28 female, inherited a holiday home from my grandma some time ago. I never really use it as it's roughly a five hour drive out from London where I live. It's relevant to the story that the keys to the holiday home are on a rack with literally every other key to anything my boyfriend or I own. The holiday house has a security system hooked up to my phone. When it detects someone on the property, cameras turn on and I can see them. My boyfriend's brother, 33 male, recently had his fourth kid. Him and his wife currently live in a two bedroom apartment. So three days ago, they were both over at mine and my boyfriend's house with all their kids. He was talking about anything and everything. I was holding the baby. My boyfriend's brother eventually mentioned how I have my holiday home and how it has more than enough space for him and his wife to raise their four kids. My exact response was, yeah, but I'm not going to let you live there. So he went quiet after that and his wife started to collect their kids and their things. They left about 10 minutes after. My boyfriend hasn't said anything to me about the conversation yet. I'm feeling bad about my response because I know that they really do need the space. So fast forward to yesterday. I wake up for work and I realize my boyfriend isn't in the bed. Nothing out of the ordinary. He works from 8.30 a.m. When I'm finally about to walk out the door, I go to grab my keys and notice my holiday home's keys are gone. I look around for them, can't find them, so I call my boyfriend. First time he doesn't answer. Second time he doesn't answer. Third time he does. The conversation went, hey, have you seen my other house's keys? Yes, I have them. Cool. Why do you have them though? Grab them by accident. I'll return them when I'm back from work. I thought everything would be fine, so I continued with my day and went on to work. Midway through my work day, I get a notification from the house's security system. I open it and find my boyfriend, his brother, and his family all outside the door with a moving van in the back. I was fuming. When I got home, my boyfriend was already there, acting as if everything was normal. I started screaming at him asking why he had moved a family into my house without my permission. He tried to justify it and say he had to help his family. It honestly made me more angry. I told him that we were over. He has one day to get his brother and his family out of my house or I will call the police on them all for trespassing. That all happened around 6 yesterday, 14 hours ago. He hasn't called me or anything, but I fully intend to go through with my threat. But I know they're struggling right now. So, would I be the jerk for calling the police? Edit. Thanks for all the advice. By searching through the UK's government website, I've managed to figure out what I can legally do. I've also called the police on them already. I haven't received any updates on that yet, but I'll share them when I can. Edit 2. I called the police a small while ago. About 30 minutes ago, they came and returned my keys and let me know that the family had been told to leave by them. At first, they refused but eventually they packed their things up and went. My ex-boyfriend, his brother, and his brother's wife have been blowing up my phone, asking why I'd put them and their kids through this. I've blocked them all. I feel absolutely terrible about what I did, and I know there were probably better ways to handle the situation. I even considered letting them stay after all, but I'm not sure if they would pay rent or anything. For the future, I plan to rent the home out, as many of you have suggested, but I'm not sure how my ex-boyfriend's family would take that. Not the jerk. Call the police now. Do not procrastinate out of confusion and misplaced kindness any longer. This is a bad situation, and the longer you delay addressing it, the more complex and difficult it will become. These are people who made the conscious choice to deceive you and steal from you. You cannot trust them to behave reasonably or predictably. 
you need to get them out of your property, have the locks changed, and pursue whatever legal action is available to you to ensure that they are sufficiently cowed to be unlikely to risk doing something this foolish again. This. I'm not sure how squatting rights work in the UK, but the less time they have there, the better. I would have driven right down there and started throwing their crap out on the lawn. Not the jerk. Sorry, but for all the people saying that OP is making kids homeless, A. It wasn't their house to suddenly move into to begin with, and B. It is not OP's responsibility to provide shelter. The parents are the one responsible, and they are essentially squatting. It was not in the boyfriend's gift to decide what happens to that house. It takes time to box things up and planning a move, so it's possible boyfriend and his family must have been planning this for some time behind OP's back. Will they be paying for the rent and bills? Has any of that been considered, or were they planning to have OP foot the bill? I'd call the police, OP. Not the jerk. It's your property. You said no, and your boyfriend literally went behind your back and moved his brother and his family into your house. Call the police before you have a case of squatting on your hands. What else does he do behind your back? It is also not your problem that his brother and four kids live in a two-bedroom place. Firstly, they didn't have to have four kids, and it's his responsibility, not yours, to ensure adequate housing. Once again, not the jerk. Well, what would you have done in this situation? Would you have let him live in your vacation house or not? Please let us know. I would have set up some booby traps. Have you ever seen the Goonies? My mom seriously embarrassed me by arguing with a cashier. But was she actually in the right? So my mom, my sister, who's 14, and I, male 16, went to the mall to watch a movie. After it ended, we decided to shop for a while and they wanted to enter this women's clothing store. Once they had their clothes, we all went to pay. One of the things my sister chose was a $12 blouse. When the cashier scanned it, the price said $60 instead of $12, and the cashier said it was a system mistake. She said that she was going to scan a $6 ring twice so that it can charge the right price for the blouse. The cashier did what she said, but when my mother finished paying, she saw that she had also been charged the extra $60 because the lady forgot to remove it. The cashier said it was a mistake, and I was starting to get embarrassed because my mother asked for the extra money back. The cashier said she couldn't do that and called the manager who said that the store had a no return policy so they couldn't pay back unless she created a store account and made a minimal purchase. Long story short, my mom kept arguing with them until they just opened the cash register and gave her back the money. When we were in the car, I told my mother that it was embarrassing and I was ashamed. She got mad at me and my sister is neutral on the situation. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. It honestly sounds like they were trying to scam your mother. She was smart to fight for her money back. Also, even in the best case, they wanted to charge almost $50, 60 is the worst, more than the price tag. That's not a small sum. Plus, they rang up a $6 ring twice? I know they said no returns, but if they walked out of the store, they have no proof they bought the sweater, even if they create a store account. They only have proof they bought two rings. You're the jerk. Good for your mom for pushing them until they returned the money they tried to steal from her. You're 16 years old. If it was so embarrassing, you could have walked out of the store for a few minutes to spare yourself. Well, what would you have done in this situation? Would you have just forgotten about the $60 or not? Please let us know. Absolutely not. There's a huge difference between being a Karen and just sticking up for yourself. Company refuses to pay me overtime. I left the job site with a job incomplete and a client unhappy. This happened years ago when I was just starting to wake up to companies mistreating employees and employees taking it because they are just thankful to have a job. I worked as a sales rep for a company in the technology field. Two-way radios and alarms to be specific. Said company never had enough technical staff, so I started training myself and asked our lead technician to teach me to program and sort out minor problems, as well as do installations, which was nice since I was doing client visits one to four times a month depending on how big the client was, and then I could sort out problems while I was on site. I ended up doing most of my clients' installations, and the manager of the technical department was happy because it's less work for him, and he knows I do the jobs properly because I want to keep my clients happy. Accordingly, he had no problem signing my timesheets and overtime hours as well. Overtime was around 10 to 20 hours a month, so 2 to 5 hours a week, which I think was a great deal considering I was doing the jobs of two people actually. It went well for a few months until one day, just before payday, I get called in by the MD, owner. He had my timesheets for the past few months in front of him. 
He asked me what they were, and I gave him an explanation. He scratched my overtime out, saying sales reps don't get paid overtime. I tried to explain to him why I was claiming overtime and that he can ask the tech manager, but he was having none of it. I was upset as it was a little extra money, but whatever. About a week later, I was at a client about 160 kilometers, 100 miles, from the office. We had a big installation and was almost done except for programming and tidying up some cables. I checked the time and told the apprentice technician to pack up. He was like, but we're not done with the job. I told him I don't care. I don't get paid overtime. It's 2 p.m. and it's still a two-hour drive back to the office. We packed up. Client comes out and I gave him the explanation, saying we will be back the following morning to finish what was effectively 30 to 45 minutes of work. Client wasn't happy, but understands that I don't get paid to work late. I was on the road about 15 minutes when my phone rang. It was the owner, same one that said I don't get paid overtime. He asked what I was doing and why I wasn't finishing the job as the client was not happy. I told him the explanation above, and then I said that he said I don't get paid overtime, so I'm not working late and will drive back to finish tomorrow. Silence for about five seconds, as I assume he realized I was following his express instructions and there was nothing he could do. He told me to go back and finish the job and we can talk about it later. I told him no, unless he pays me overtime. He says he will. I tell him to put it in an email before I will turn back. I could hear him go red in the face. He said he will send it now. I switched on my laptop, connected my dongle. This was still before smartphones and email on phones. A few minutes later, the email came through. We turned around and finished the job. I got paid my overtime and never again was there a query over my timesheets or hours booked. I was the only rep out of five that got paid overtime. Am I the jerk for telling a friend the real reason why a coworker wants to date him? I, 24 female, have a friend from work, 26 male, Ben. Over the years, coworkers told me Ben was interested in me, but I brushed it off. When I met Ben, I had a boyfriend who is now my husband. Ben met him and was even invited to our wedding, so the thought of him liking me was ridiculous. I ended up confronting him about it and he said that he did like me at first, but stopped once he realized I was taken. My husband knows this and is totally fine with it. I never saw Ben as anything more than a friend. Two months ago, I caught a coworker, Kate, who's 23, crying in the parking lot after work. I asked what was wrong, and she told me her boyfriend broke up with her and left the country after they found out she got pregnant and she insisted on keeping the baby. Kate is white with blue eyes and blonde hair, and so is her ex. Most people in my country are tan and have brown eyes and black hair. This info is important later on. After the breakup, Kate went out on dates every day. The guys had one thing in common blue eyes, blonde hair. I joked that she must have a type, but she told me that she was looking for someone to father her baby, so they had to look similar to her ex so that the baby could pass as theirs. This horrified me, but it wasn't my place to tell her anything. A month ago, Ben and I had lunch when he told me that he started dating Kate. Ben is the only guy in our office with blonde hair and blue eyes. I told him dating Kate might not be the best idea, he asked why and I gave him some excuses on how they're not compatible in my opinion. After lunch, I went up to Kate and told her what she's doing is wrong and asked her not to do this to my friend. She laughed it off and said it's okay and he won't find out. I stayed quiet for a while but eventually told Ben he should seriously stop dating Kate. He said he figured I'll try to break them up because I'm jealous. He said I kept stringing him along for years because he's such a nice guy and now that he is meeting another woman, I realized what I missed out on. I was disgusted before finally saying to not come crying to me when he realizes Kate is only dating him so another man's baby could have a father. I stopped talking to Ben shortly after and everything was relatively peaceful in the office. That was until Kate announced she's pregnant. I could see the color drain from Ben's face as he looked in my direction. A huge fight broke out between the two after Ben demanded a paternity test when Kate tried to convince him it wasn't necessary. Kate called me later, screaming that I ruined her life, so my guess is they broke up. The thing is, they really do deserve each other, so I'm starting to wonder whether I made the right decision by telling Ben the truth. If I hadn't, they would have probably gotten married and the baby would have had a loving father to look after him. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Kate is a jerk and Ben should stop being so full of himself. Stringing him along because he's a nice guy? Goodness gracious. Well, who do you think is the jerk? 
OP or Kate or Ben? Please let us know. Kate and Ben would have been perfect for each other. They both sound like absolute fools. Am I the jerk? I didn't help my ex-wife. My ex-wife and I had very different views about spending money. After the birth of our daughter three years back, she started spending a lot of unnecessary money. I tried having discussions with her about budgeting, but she refused, saying that all of it was necessary for her. Some of the expenses were definitely necessary, such as a mother's helper, maid, cook, etc., and I had no problem with those kinds of expenses that would help her recover from childbirth. But there were others that were purely unnecessary and lavish, such as shopping, etc. It all reached a breaking point when she paid for her brother's college tuition from our joint account without even asking me if I was okay with it. I divorced her and we got equal custody of our daughter, along with me having to pay child support because our daughter was still very small. I had to also give her half of my business. I didn't want to run a business with her, so I sold my business and gave her half the money. I started a new business on my own and it's doing pretty well now. Today, when I went to my mom's birthday party, my ex-wife was also present. My ex was a family friend, so she's still close to my parents despite our divorce. After dinner, I and my brothers were watching a movie. At that time, my mom came to me and told me she wants to speak to me in private. We stepped out of the house and my ex-wife was waiting for us there. My ex said that she lost all the money that she received from me upon divorce because her investments failed. She said that if I had been more mature by running the business with her instead of selling it off and protecting just myself, she wouldn't have been in this position now. She said that she's been evicted from her apartment and doesn't have the money even for a hotel room and told me that since I caused this, I should let her stay with me in my house. I refused and told her that she can leave our daughter with me for the time being and go stay with one of her friends or something. She started crying and my mom said I should have been more kind to my ex considering she's a close family friend. Am I the jerk? Edit. She got close to about 300 grand in the final divorce settlement including everything. Nah, forget that. This is your time to strike. I would get a lawyer and fight for custody. There's no way someone that demonstrates that she is irresponsible with finances should be able to still have custody. She's not fit to take care of the kid. Don't feel bad for her. I guarantee you that if the roles were reversed, they would tell you to deal with it. Tell her to figure it out, not the jerk. Exactly. If it were him, she would definitely sue for full custody and most likely get it too. Besides, he still paid child support even when they have equal custody. The fact OP didn't laugh in her face and call her ridiculous means he's definitely not the jerk. Marrying someone rich, or who becomes rich, shouldn't be a set-for-life scheme if you divorce early on, or if you didn't contribute significantly in a way that helped them become successful. Men and women who get rewarded for marrying well for a brief period are ridiculous jerks, and it's absurd the amounts they get to maintain their lifestyle sometimes. They're adults, they can get a job. I'm glad OP sold the business to separate from her financially. He was fair and gave her half. As long as he takes care of his daughter, he's not the jerk. And being there for his daughter doesn't mean he should be forever responsible for funding her mother's life. That's on her and she was already given a lot. I bet she'd try pushing for a relationship again now that she's broke. OP needs to take in their daughter till she can figure out how to fund her own life. She can have regular visitations. Um, not the jerk. You sold off your business and gave her half, which she was entitled to, though I will never agree with that. After that, it's on her. I know there will be comments about how she's your kid's mom, but you've offered to keep your kid so your daughter would be safe with you while she finds accommodations for the both of them. That's really as much as you need to do. If your family thinks that you're being unfair, they can offer her a place to stay. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his ex? Please let us know. If Reddit boy ever tries to leave me, I'm taking everything he owns. Am I the jerk for getting angry at my pregnant wife after she said I wasted years of my life raising my little sister? When I was 15 years old, I'm male, and my sister was 2 years old, my mom passed. After her passing, my dad changed. He became emotionally unavailable and barely showed any concern about my sister's upbringing. He was still financially available, as he would give me money at the end of each month and then just disappear. As a result, I took the parental role over my sister. I am the one who had to do everything a parent should do from cooking, advice, homework, emotional support, etc. I basically raised her. When she was 10, she asked if she can call me dad and it was the proudest moment of my life. I also consider her my daughter. Now she is 22 years old, studying for her master's degree and I'm very proud of her. I also got married and my wife recently got pregnant. We were talking one night 
and she said, I'm very excited because you will finally get a kid that you want. I did not like this comment, but I gave her the benefit of the doubt, as I had to take responsibility for my sister at a young age. I can see where she's coming from. Then she continues, I always felt sorry for you because you were stuck in that situation and were forced to waste years of your life raising a kid that was not your responsibility instead of experiencing a young adult normal life, doing normal things. But now you can get to experience the genuine thing. I was raging inside and told her, what do you mean wasted all these years? I never once thought of those years like that. I'm very proud that I was able to raise my daughter alone, despite what happened with our parents, into a healthy functioning adult. Experience the genuine thing? She is my daughter. It is as genuine as it can get. Just because you did not give birth to her, that doesn't mean our father-daughter bond is not genuine. She was shocked by how angry I got and said she was just trying to comfort me. I said, comfort me? Is this a joke? You have clearly no clue about how I feel. This happened last week and we have still not recovered from this conversation. So, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. I get why you are angry. So if you can be calm about this, I can help you get where your wife was coming from. Your wife sees childhood as an important and necessary aspect of human growth and development. She feels that you were robbed of a normal childhood because you had to take responsibility for your sister at such a young age. Not only that, but you had to do that because your father did not do what he had to in order to recover from your mother's passing so that he could continue being a father and raise the only parts of his lost love that still live. That's what she means by wasted. She's not saying that your efforts were not worth the result or that your sister was not worth the loss of your childhood. She does have some unwarranted pity for you and that's where she felt a need to comfort you. You don't need that pity and you don't want that pity. You can tell her that kindly. OP, here's my problem with this. Every time I talk about this with someone, they instantly start the pity fest. And when I tell them I do not care about the teenage life that I missed, because for me, I really loved raising my sister, they think that I'm faking it. I thought my wife would understand this, but here we go. Even my wife started the pity fest. People still talk with me from the perspective that I consider her my sister. She is my daughter. Imagine telling a father you wasted years raising your daughter. It's the same for me. Customer orders something last minute, thinks I'll come in on my day off to deliver it. So I wasn't directly involved with this. A coworker told me this happened today before we closed. For some important info, I work at a building supply store as a delivery driver. I'm the only one where I work who is licensed and certified to operate and drive a boom truck. For those who aren't familiar with them, it's a large transport truck with a crane on it for unloading material. So my coworker told me they've been dealing with this customer for several days who couldn't make up their minds on what material they wanted to redo their roof. Today alone, this customer called five times. So about an hour before the store was closing, the customer finally decided what they wanted. The customer said, I want it delivered tomorrow and boomed up to my roof. My coworker informed them that we will be unable to deliver tomorrow with a boom because their only driver license to operate the vehicle was off tomorrow. I worked five days this week, so this is my weekend off. The customer wasn't happy. They were saying, well, that's no good. I need this delivered tomorrow. And also said, I'm sure you can have your driver come in just to do my delivery. My coworker snapped back saying, no, we aren't going to ask him to come in for a delivery. It's the driver's weekend off. He's worked the whole week. He's earned his time off. They tell the customer the soonest they could get it delivered if they wanted it boomed would be when my weekend off was done. The customer repeated that that was no good, that they need the material tomorrow. My coworker said, that doesn't sound like an us emergency. If you need something boomed, we need some adequate notice. The customer replied, well, I am giving you adequate notice. My coworker explained to the customer that it wasn't adequate notice because they were placing their order within an hour of closing, expecting next day delivery, and pointed out to the customer that if they had decided on the order sooner, that they probably could have gotten it today since I was in. Eventually, the customer backed down, agreed to have everything delivered tomorrow, but it would only be dropped on the ground and not taken up to the roof. But then the customer said, and when I pay with cash, I get a discount, right? My coworker bluntly told her no. As my coworker was telling me that, I told them they could throw the law at the customer, that I had already worked five days and was near the end of my hours for what I am legally allowed to drive with that truck, just in case the customer decided to make things more difficult in the future. Am I the jerk because I won't give an employee six weeks off to be with his newborn? I'm looking for moral judgment since I know I'm legally in the clear. I'm the GM of a small grocery store. 
Because of how small our store is and how limited our hours are, we can only afford to keep a staff of five plus myself. Dave joined our staff about four and a half months ago. He's a very quiet man and he does not discuss his life outside of work. He doesn't actually say much at all. All he's really said about himself is that he's new to the area and he's in his early 20s. His performance has been, at best, slightly below average. He has a problem being on time for shifts and he has a tendency to ask to leave early on days where he's been late. He does the basic bare minimum of his duties. Dave spoke to me yesterday and revealed to me that not only is he married, but his wife is pregnant and her due date is this coming Wednesday. He asked me to give him at least four weeks off to be at home with her, but he would prefer I give him six weeks. I was shocked because none of us knew he was married, let alone with a kid on the way. I told him I'd review his request and let him know. The rule at this store has always been that time off requests must be given with a minimum two weeks notice. I tell new hires this multiple times during the onboarding process and Dave was informed of this several times. I'm also annoyed because Dave's had four months to speak to me about time off and he waited until literally four days before he needed the time off. I work six days a week at the store and I'm always available in person or on the phone. To give Dave his time, I'd have to hire someone to take his place and train them and to me that just didn't seem fair to anyone to hire someone for a month to six weeks and then let them go. But we just don't have the ability to keep Dave and a new hire and the rest of my staff. Now we've had staff ask for time off before and we can handle a two or three week absence, but six weeks is too much to ask of my staff. It isn't fair on them. I spoke to Dave today and told him I couldn't give him the time off he asked for, but that I could give him two weeks off. I later offered three weeks and then give him a reduced schedule for as long as he needed so he could still be with his family and make money. Dave was shockingly angry when I denied his request. Like, he was annoyed. He was furious. He began accusing me of being unfair and said that if a woman had asked me for the time off to have a baby, I'd have given it to her. I informed him that when I gave birth to my child, I was only able to take off three weeks. And we've only had one other employee take maternity, and she was able to take a month before she told me she'd need the time off with about five months of notice. Dave went back to work in a bad mood. Members of staff said he was badmouthing me. I'm not going to fire him at this time because I'm sure he's stressed enough as it is. But was I the jerk for not giving him exactly what he wanted? Edit. We're in North Carolina, where we do not have a paid family leave for anyone other than state employees, and in cases where the business offers it. FMLA only qualifies if your business has a certain number of employees, the employee has worked a certain amount of hours in a 12-month period, and the employee gave 30 days notice for the request. The most I have the ability to offer an employee is unpaid leave, but I don't legally have to guarantee employment. That said, I would never take advantage of this law. Neighbor trespassed on my property twice to turn off my outdoor lighting. Some backstory. We moved in about six months ago. First house in California. There are some soft lights around the house for security. I keep them at 1% brightness. Only time this neighbor has said anything to us was to shout at us about cutting down some trees. The trees were dying anyway. He's never talked to us about the light being a nuisance. I'm guessing it's more visible now without the trees, but again, he's never said anything to us about it. The last two weekends, I've caught him on video entering our property, going over a short, four-foot fence, and unscrewing our light bulb. The second time, the fixture was completely broken and will need to be replaced. He tried to shield his face from our garage security camera while entering the property, but must not have known the other camera was there. My video is clear as day. He left our property with his finger up while his back was to the garage camera. We can't really afford a tall fence right now, but it's on my list ASAP. In the meantime, this has been giving me a lot of anxiety. I already have a lot. It scares me that someone would be willing to trespass on and vandalize our property without talking to us about it at all. I'm not sure what he'd do if I confront him and tell him that I have a video of him. I want to avoid violence or any further damage to my property or loved ones, and all I've seen is an angry man who doesn't care about the rules. I called the sheriff who said the neighbor is 100% in the wrong and offered to come by to tell him it's an arrestable crime if he's caught again. I'm just not sure I should jump to that first. Seems so crazy that someone thinks this is okay. Stresses me out and I could really use some advice on how to handle this. My priorities are, in order, keep my family, pets, and property safe. Stop this from happening ever again. Peace.
Would be nice to avoid prolonged confrontation if at all possible. I don't want to live with stress, but seems like this one is impossible. So, the guy never talked to you, save for yelling at you, trespassed twice on your property, and destroyed your property on the second time he committed the crime. Listen, there's an old saying, only commit one crime at a time. Let's count his crimes at the moment. 1. Trespassing 2. Destruction of property Get the sheriff involved. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you call the cops on your neighbor or not? Please let us know. To be honest, someone would probably have to call the cops on me, bruh. Shady boss lied about my position to keep me from policy allowed benefits for years. I found out and it changed everything. A few years ago, I worked at a big retail company and had for many years. Eventually, I went through enough grad school education to get my license to work at a higher level. Much more pay, more job satisfaction, more responsibilities, fancy title, but the job market was rough. I stayed on with my company to work in a floater position where I would cover a large area and work at all the stores within that area on a rotating but irregular basis. Eventually, I wanted to get a staff position where I have a single store assigned. The area was huge, the furthest store being over 100 miles from my house, and that is exactly where I was assigned to train for the new role. It was a rough store. Folks in my position were robbed and assaulted. Neighborhood was very unfriendly. Volume at the store was among the highest in the state. Staff turnover was, as you might expect, extreme. Well, after training, I wasn't really being scheduled to float to other stores. Once a month, at most. I asked to be scheduled a little more diversely, since most of the stores in my area were much closer to my home and didn't require four hours of driving a day. Boss man told me that I was the only floater experienced enough to handle that store. I didn't buy it, but what can you do, right? Well, a colleague told me about the mileage reimbursement policy. Floaters working at a store more than 50 miles from home can file for reimbursement of mileage over that 50 miles each way, can even include meals. So I filled out a few of these and sent them to my boss to sign. He didn't quite refuse, but he never actually signed and filed them. I suspect as soon as I left his office at our district center, he tossed them out. Boss man tells me later that they must be lost in the system. Eventually, the same colleague showed me how to fax those same forms to accounts payable, bypassing the district boss man. So I started doing just that. One day, boss man calls me in a panic. He wants to stop my filing the forms. I asked to be floated closer to home, but he won't budge. He needs me at that miserable store. He promises me he'll make me a staff role at that store if I promise to stop faxing those forms. Staff roles are a promotion and usually come with better pay and a few other little conveniences, so I agree. Boss man says there won't be a pay bump right away, but that it'll come down the road. That never happened. Two years later, the situation at this store has become too toxic for even me. I asked to step down from the staff position to be a floater again and be allowed to float to other stores. Boss man says that I am already a floater, never was in a staff position, but that he can't let me work at any other stores because it's better for me and the customers if I stay there for familiarity. Floaters do not get scheduled to stores exclusively, so I'm being singled out because they are still desperate to cover that dump of a store. I'm livid, so I start looking. It took me months, but eventually I found an opportunity to make my dream career transition. I put in my formal notice, and that's when the fun started. Remember that whole mileage reimbursement policy? Well, I kept meticulous track of all my shifts, and there is no statute of limitations baked into the policy, so I started filling out those reimbursements forms to retroactively cover every single shift from the past two odd years. I skipped the meal part since I didn't want to go through all that effort of finding receipts. I had a friendly store manager sign off on them, and I started sending them to accounts payable directly again. I didn't fax them all in at once, but for each shift in my final two weeks, I faxed a few dozen in. We still have fax machines in that line of work, believe it or not. I figured, what do I have to lose? Worst case scenario, accounts payable declines the forms. On my last few shifts, I started getting the checks from accounts payable. Not added to my paycheck, but sent to me directly. Mileage reimbursements are not taxable income, so this was all tax-free money coming to me. It must have taken a while for the charges to show up on a balance sheet because a few weeks after my final paycheck, I got a call from my now former boss man. He wasn't happy. He got some big loss prevention manager involved and together they started saying I was breaking some rule by requesting the payments. They specifically claimed I was ineligible 
because I agreed I wouldn't be eligible in a staff position. They then threatened legal action against me if I didn't remit the full amounts back that same week. But I had the email chain from when boss man said I was never staff and always a floater. I politely referenced that email chain before letting them know firmly that because I was lied to, our prior agreement didn't apply and I was fully eligible all along. Corporate policy, as confirmed by HR, agreed with me, so I let them know I wasn't returning a single penny. In the end, the reimbursements amounted to well over $21,000, and I transitioned into my dream job. I could say that I would trade that money back for the time I lost commuting to that miserable store, four hours every shift, but all that pressure motivated me to making the best career move of my life. The great satisfaction of not only professionally surpassing my old boss, but getting to tell him that his lies cost him way more on the way out is almost priceless. I also shared my story and method with many colleagues who were being told wrongly by the boss man that they didn't qualify for this policy. Edit 1. Thank you all for the support and comments. As many of you correctly guessed, I was working as a community pharmacist. I do want to clarify that most of my coworkers, technicians, pharmacists, front-end staff, and customers and patients were amazing people. Between them and my subscription to Audible with a long list of books I always wanted to read, it made the situation such that I could tolerate that commute for all that time. The job market for retail pharmacy was, slash is, also very rough, and I can't overstate that enough. It has empowered big chains to mistreat their staff in this and other ways, and that also endangers patient care, not to mention staff mental health. I spent more than 10 months searching before I found an opportunity, and that involved me leaving the profession entirely. The district manager, boss man, and the store general manager, who was fully complicit in the lie, are both still working for the company last I saw. Moral of the story, please understand your company policies and ignore any verbal agreements or HR unsupported decrees otherwise, and be kind to your pharmacy staff. The job and companies are not always kind to them. Am I the jerk for refusing to make my husband apologize for what he said to my mom at dinner? So I, female 31, recently got married to my husband, Scott, male 36. Before I met him, I was engaged to my former fiancé, Martin, but we broke it off because this relationship was sort of pushed by my family because he's a doctor and comes from a wealthy family. When our relationship ended, my mom was devastated. She did her best to bring us back together. For example, she lied to Martin about me being pregnant to save us. That was years ago. Now we're all on good terms, including Martin. Mom has a bit of tension towards Scott. She treats him well, but constantly makes passive, nagging comments about him. She compares him to Martin all the time, which bothers both of us, but we try to let it slide. Mom kept telling Scott about the diamond ring, new car, and bank account Martin got for his fiancé, and kept sending him photos saying how generous Martin is to his fiancé, then compared him to Scott and what he had done for me. I told her stop doing this, and she apologized. Last week, we were over at my parents' house for a social gathering. Lots of relatives came and we had dinner. At the dinner table, mom asked Scott if he saw the text she sent him the other day. He said he was sorry and that he didn't see it. She told him to check it right then and read it out loud so everyone at the dinner table could hear. He took his phone and started reading the text out loud. Her text mentioned how Martin got his fiance a new house and how generous he was, then said that Martin is younger than Scott, yet was able to buy a house basically shaming Scott for his inability to buy a house. She wrapped up by saying that Martin maybe wasn't so bad for me after all. I was shocked and Scott was upset, obviously. However, he didn't lash out or anything. He looked at the text, smiled and said, you know, what gets me about this entire text is how you were a public educator for 30 years, yet you can't differentiate between the passive you and the contradiction your. Goodness, the thought of all the kids that must have been left behind. Everyone at the table burst into laughter, and mom's face went pale. She decided to leave the table, then she and my sister started yelling at me, saying Scott was being awfully rude and I need to get him to apologize immediately for embarrassing mom at the table. I refused to tell him to apologize, then pointed out how she was being judgmental towards him. She defended herself, saying that she was just letting him know, and he had no confidence and took it personally. I left, but kept getting told to talk to him and get him to apologize for what he did. You're the jerk. Why are you letting your mom treat your husband this way? Yes, your husband handled it like a champ, but grow a spine and tell your mom in no uncertain terms to cut it out. Right? 
How the heck is reading the passive-aggressive text from mom going to turn out well for him? The husband could have said no, but OP's mom got what she deserved. I have to say, you're the jerk for brushing your mom's behavior to the side. Stop being around that type of nastiness. If I were your husband, I would have put my foot down. No more of your mom's visits. If she comes over, and no more visiting. If you want to go, go alone. You obviously have not done enough to put your mom in her place. If the tables were turned, you would want to be defended against your in-laws. You're the jerk for even thinking Scott might need to apologize to your mom. You're the jerk for not shutting your mom down a long time ago. Your mom is a total jerk who needs to be the one apologizing for her appalling behavior. Your sister is a jerk for siding with your bullying mom. Scott is a gym and not the jerk. He's brilliant. Am I the jerk for taking away my brother's birthday cake after he had paid for it? My brother, Rob, is a self-proclaimed prankster. He loves pulling pranks on everyone, including strangers. His pranks, in my opinion, aren't funny and may land him in serious trouble in the future. His pranks are just antagonizing someone until he gets bored and then calling it a prank. Rob's behavior has seriously affected my relationship with him. When I first started dating my wife, Haley, he made it a habit at every gathering I would attend with her to prank her. Not just an average whoopee cushion or a rubber snake, like hiding her glasses for hours on end or pouring vinegar in her tea. He claims he does it to make Hallie less posh and uptight. My family is like him as well, a bunch of self-proclaimed jokesters. I don't speak to them much. My wife, Hallie, gave birth to our beautiful son six months ago. According to my family, we've been rationing our family visits. The first time they saw our son was when he was four months and they haven't seen him since. My family isn't very happy with this arrangement and they've been spamming me with calls, texts, and even emailing me, asking, begging, to see the baby. They want weekly or even daily visits, but that just isn't possible. Rob invited us for his 30th birthday and asked Haley to make his birthday cake. Not just any basic, simple vanilla cake, but one of those fancy, detailed, decorated cakes that requires lots of time and effort. I was hesitant to go, and even more hesitant to let Haley bake him the cake. But Haley assured me that it would be alright, and attending the birthday might ease my family off our back. Rob paid her, up front, for the cake that he specifically wanted. Haley also made cupcakes, just because she wanted to. Haley and I arrive at my brother's house earlier than everyone else, and when everyone arrived, I was pleasantly surprised to see how well the whole thing was going. They were very excited to meet my son, and they were very respectful towards Haley. Rob kept telling Haley to watch her back. I had no idea he meant it literally. While my wife was handling the cake, he came up behind her and poured cold water all over her. This obviously scared her a little and caused her to drop the cake. Rob got extremely upset, claiming that she dropped the cake on purpose. Haley started to apologize for dropping the cake while water was all over her, but I wasn't having any of it and I admittedly lost my temper a little. I yelled at Rob for being so irresponsible and irrational, grabbed the cupcakes that Haley had made, which were untouched, and left with my family. It was a little dramatic. The next day I woke up to a string of angry texts from Rob, telling me I had no right to take the cupcakes away from him because he had rightfully paid for them and this wouldn't have happened if Haley could handle a little cold water. Haley thinks that I should at least apologize in the hopes that it would make everything go away. Not the jerk. Um, your family sucks. Tell Rob that it's obviously his fault that Haley dropped the cake. Pranks are not funny, and his idea of pranks are just bullying. Tell your family that since they seem incapable of treating you and your family with any respect or decency, that you will be taking a break from them. Explain that this break will last at least until you and your wife receive a sincere apology from Rob and a promise to cut his crap out from now on, and an acknowledgement from others that Rob's behavior and treatment of your wife is unacceptable. Not the jerk. More importantly, the brother needs therapy. He's a grown man that acts like a kid wanting attention and will go so far as to ruin his own birthday, birthday cake, and relationship with his brother to get it. Tell your parents this crap is the reason they don't see your kid. They can't be trusted. Yes, absolutely. Self-proclaimed jokesters are just mean people hiding behind prankster mask. Not the jerk. Is your brother six? He sounds exhausting and very unpleasant. So does the rest of your family. Your wife sounds like a saint. Oh, and self-proclaimed jokesters or pranksters are usually just bullies. Your brother sure is.
Am I the jerk for telling my husband his name suggestion for our unborn baby is idiotic at best? Hello all. This has caused quite a stir on both sides of the family and my niece suggested I post this here so as to garner unbiased opinions. Unfortunately, as it is relevant to the story, I will have to keep much personal information uncensored in this story. As such, this is a throwaway account. Me, 35 female, and my husband, 37 male, are pregnant with our first child. We are overjoyed as we have struggled with this for the last decade. We want the gender to be a surprise, but may have to find out to settle this. I'm currently at the tail end of my second trimester. Now, my husband absolutely idolized his grandpa, who unfortunately passed only last week. My husband is brokenhearted, especially about the notion that his kids will never meet their great grandpa who their father adored so much. As such, my husband has suggested that we name the baby after grandpa. Theodore if it's a boy, Theodora if it's a girl. Either way, we will either call them Teddy or Theo or Thea respectively. It's not that I mind the name, the issue is that our last name is Bundy. I asked my husband, do you really see no issue in naming our kid Teddy followed by our last name? You don't think that that would raise any concerns? He says no, he's just honoring his grandpa. I told him he needs to think about how this will be perceived, how our kid will be treated, and the implications that the name inherently carries. I literally had to spell out why that would be a horrible idea, and he still thinks I just don't like his grandpa. I told him no, grandpa was named in 1930, when this name wouldn't have been a problem. However, since certain events in the 70s and 80s, there's no feasible way we can give this name to our kid and not cause issues. He kept pushing and pushing until I blew up and told him to stop with the idiotic suggestion. And that's what it is, idiotic at best. He got extremely upset and told his family and my parents who are divided. His family is obviously on his side and wants to honor grandpa via naming the baby after him. My parents are torn but on my side as they understand the social pariah we would make our kid by giving them such a similar name to the person who did such bad things. I mean, personally, I don't think anyone is just going to assume that we are honoring a past loved one. They're just going to think of the criminal. Am I the jerk? Edit. Just to say that you guys are all proving my point that his name is clearly still infamous. There has not been one comment that didn't immediately make the correlation upon hearing my last name. That is exactly what I don't want to have happen to my kid. Kids are jerks and they're going to find a way to be mean. Let's not just hand them the material. Not the jerk. I have a friend who has a very similar name to a well-known criminal. He has to wind up basically apologizing for his name wherever he goes, even though he has absolutely no relation to the guy. It's pretty sad. There are many ways you can honor your husband's grandfather without giving the baby such an unfortunate name. Well, what do you think? Do you agree with OP or her husband? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for paying for another bride's wedding dress, but not my daughter's? My husband and I worked hard and managed to become financially secure adults after both of us grew up in poverty. We raised our kids to work hard. We did not spoil them or provide them with a lavish life. As teens, they all had part-time jobs, but we did purchase them their own used cars, which they were required to maintain. We also paid for college and we paid for our oldest two kids' weddings. However, we were merely the ones paying and we did not provide any input or suggestions unless asked. The only thing we didn't pay for for their weddings was our son's tuxedo and our oldest daughter's wedding dress. Our youngest daughter, Michaela, is engaged and we are paying for her wedding with the exception of her dress. She must buy her own wedding dress. Michaela invited us to help her pick a dress at her bridal party. She found a beautiful dress in her budget and we were so honored to have been allowed to take part in her finding the dress and seeing herself as a bride. While there, I complimented another bride on a dress she was wearing and her mother and I struck up conversation and I learned that the family were low income and both the bride and groom and the bride's parents had taken out loans to have a beautiful wedding. The bride is also plus size and I learned that she has been to six different stores and there had only been a few options for her size and all of them had just been awful. The bride ended up falling in love with the last dress she tried but was brokenhearted to learn that the consultant had misread the price tag and the dress was actually $1,000 over budget and with alterations to make it her size, it was another $1,400. The bride took the dress and said that she'd try to find something online. I grew up poor and I was also chubby. I was bullied and I was very unhappy. I always wanted more and in this bride I saw myself and I didn't want her to have to settle for a dress that fit versus a dress she loved. 
So while my daughter was trying a different one, I asked the other bride if I could pay the differences on her dress. It was very emotional. We all held each other and cried. She accepted. I very happily paid the difference on her dress. Her mother, herself, and I are now friends on Facebook, and my husband and I have been invited to the wedding, which we will gladly attend. I felt very honored to have been allowed to help this girl in a small way, and being invited to her wedding was so unexpected and so amazing. When Michaela found out about this, she threw a fit and said that I obviously had shown how I truly feel about her wedding and herself, and if I cared at all, I would have paid for her dress too. She's now not speaking to me or to her father, who didn't even have a hand in this, which is unfair. She has now uninvited us from the wedding. We're so hurt and confused. Was I the jerk? Edit. I wanted to add, Michaela didn't know I'd pay for the dress while we were at the bridal shop. She was in the fitting room doing a last minute try on and I took the opportunity to go to the payment counter during that time. So Michaela didn't lose any of my attention. In fact, we were all done. She had picked her dress, we had celebrated. She wasn't in the same part of the shop as us. She didn't find out until a few hours later at dinner when her dad accidentally revealed it then. He's a little talkative and didn't mean to reveal it. Not the jerk. If Michaela has uninvited you to the wedding, she has obviously uninvited your dollars too. Not the jerk. You were paying for her wedding. The only thing she has to buy herself is her dress. Your daughter is acting very entitled. Tell her you are no longer paying for her wedding as you are no longer invited. I bet she changes her tune real quick. OP. So far, we've paid around $26,000 for the wedding. Maybe we should suggest taking all that back. I think you should at least email her an accounting or funds spent on the wedding to date and what the expected final bill will be. Subject line, financial independence, wedding. Good evening, Michaela. While I know you are terribly upset at the costs of your wedding, which were to be borne by your father and I, did not include your wedding gown, I also know that your father and I are equally upset at being excluded from your guest list. You've declared financial independence, for which I applaud you. A talented, intelligent young woman and her equally amazing husband should start off life as fully realized adults, sharing all matters. What I'm sending you now is an updated list of vendors and costs to date, with the approximate remaining costs for the wedding. I will include you and your fiancé on the emails that I sent to them requesting that the ownership and responsible parties for the part of the wedding be transferred to you and your fiancé. Most of the contracts, which your father and I are reviewing, have breakage fees, so we will not be able to recoup all of the costs spent to date. You will need to get in touch with them individually to determine what your revised costs will be after they deduct the non-refundable part of our deposits. I so wish this could have been different, but your father and I feel strongly that we must respect your autonomy and decisions alongside those of your husband-to-be. With love, Mom. Well, what do you think? Should OP still pay for her daughter's wedding or not? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for not going to Easter because it's always all about the kids? I'm 26, two kids, and four out of five sisters have kids, with the exception of Serena, who is a travel the world with a knapsack kind of gal. I love my family, but every single family outing, get together, every dinner, lunch, everything has to be family friendly and kid centric. I can never get my sisters, other than Serena, when she's even in town, to go to a movie, have lunch, sit and chat without it being all about the kids. Even if the kids are having a kid playtime with each other and the adults are sitting around drinking coffee, the conversations are about the kids. Kids are called over to talk to us, etc, etc. Before lockdown, I asked my sister Julie to come over with me to get our nails done and just have some us time. She changed her mind last minute and said she was bringing her daughter as a bonding activity. We do nothing but bonding activities, and the same thing has happened time and time again. Shopping? The kids need to come. Taking a hike? All on board. I expressed my frustration, and she acted like I was being super out of line, shocked, and went on about how she can't imagine doing things without her mini-me, and that it was weird. It became a whole, are you okay? Are you sure? Are you depressed? thing. The requisite Zoom family things were all about the kids with no adult time, so when we were talking about getting together for Easter, I thought, hey, maybe they'll want to catch up. I asked during a planning call, do you think we can maybe just have some time for the adults when the kids are playing so we can all catch up? My mom and sisters acted like it was the most ridiculous ask. Mom did the, are you okay? And, I can't imagine wanting to spend time with my family and exclude you girls from any part of it. That's not normal. I said that I really can't sit through another kid-centric get-together, 
and that if we aren't going to at least do something and sit down and have cake and coffee together and catch up, just the family, then count me out. Well, they went through with it, and I ended up sending the girls over and staying home and having a great time, just me and Serena. She said that she understands how I feel, and she stands with me, because they exclude her as well since she doesn't have kids and has been clear that she never will. Of course, she and I are being talked down to and told that we're jerks to treat family like that, that we should have all been together as a family, and that it's time to grow up and accept that it'll never just be the sisters again. I cried about this a lot. Am I really wrong here? Is this normal and I just need to accept never seeing my other sisters one-on-one -on -one without their kids being the focus of everything? Guys, just a couple of points because it keeps coming up. I didn't ask for a kid-free Easter at all. I asked for some time for the adults to drink coffee and catch up with each other while the kids were playing. And I have friends, but family and friends are different. Work is 8 to 4 only. Not me, but my coworker, and I am super proud of them. The past few years, I've been putting up firm boundaries with work after being done over a few times, including not being expected to answer emails or do assignments evenings and weekends. It's taken a long time, but I've learned my worth and that my time is valuable. Our company has about 200 employees, but I work most closely with one other person who I've been encouraging to do the same. We were all put on remote work since last March, and recently the building opened again with the exception that we would start back in person. I'll give props to them. They've done a ton of work to get the building cleaned, the air filters updated, enforcing masking, etc. However, HR at first talked a lot about how they would be willing to be flexible since most schools are still closed and people needed childcare worked out, and that they would grant accommodations with people who had health concerns. Yet, that didn't actually play out. In my situation, I had a unique childcare concern that had a simple solution, but they refused to budge. Long story short, I needed to start 30 minutes later and was told no. Several other coworkers have shared similar stories of not getting any flexibility whatsoever. My coworker has several health issues and requested to work on an alternate schedule and was told, the job is eight to four, so that's when you must be here. Understandably, they were upset. We've both been there well over a decade and it's kind of a slap in the face to dedicate yourself to a place that talks up community and family and then told no after being promised flexibility. Here's the malicious compliance. The company handles missed time by covering in-house. So for instance, if someone has a meeting at a certain time or calls in sick, someone who has a break or lunch covers them and gets paid a little stipend for it. We're talking like $20, not much. But if you take a few extras over a week, it can add up to a nice little bit in your pay. My coworker coordinates all of this and does it on Sunday for the upcoming week. Even though they don't work on Sunday, they would say it only takes about an hour to do and it makes everyone's life so much easier since everyone walks in Monday morning knowing who is covering when, so it's worth it. Can you see where this is going? Upset at the lack of accommodation, my coworker decided to take HR's word for it. They stopped sending the coverage email on the weekend and did it at 8 sharp on Monday. It was like the end of the world. Everyone was scrambling. Such a little thing to make life convenient, but they refuse now to do anything outside of work hours. They told me that the following weekend, managers were asking for it throughout Saturday and Sunday, but they ignored the emails. On Monday, they sent it at 8 a.m. sharp again. By the afternoon, the head boss had asked them to please resume doing it on the weekend, and they are now getting the extra hour paid by the company. I loved it. Take care of your employees, and they take care of you. Give a little, get a little. Here's some info asked about in the comments. 1. My coworker doesn't have a disability, but is nearing retirement age and has some minor medical concerns that could make getting sick very complicated. 2. From what I understand, they requested to continue remotely, and I'm not surprised that was denied. While their role could be done at home, with people back in the building, it wouldn't make much sense. They do a lot of the front office stuff, where my role is more in the background. I could do my job no problem going in only once a week, but their role really does need to be on site while people are there. I believe they had asked to do some days at home or half days at home. That would work if HR had let them. 3. It seems from what I have gathered, only two people were granted remote accommodations. One person I know has some complicated medical issues, so that made sense to me. Most people asking for flexibility have roles that, like mine, don't necessitate being on site. I was told that my requested accommodation would be unfair because everyone needs to be treated equally, and I get that, except most work with clients and I don't. 
My role is completely internal support. There are others like me who do back-end stuff or support in other ways who were denied what I consider minor accommodations in the spirit of fairness but would make life a million times easier. My new neighbor thinks she can park anywhere. This is currently happening and my significant other is witnessing it and texting me it while I'm at work. I had a new neighbor move into my building and she left notes on everyone's doors saying that she had bought the building and gave us insane rules to follow. She does not own the building, but only a unit or apartment. Jury is still out if she is insane or stupid. She's been quiet for the last few days, and I thought maybe that was it. Apparently, I was wrong. So each unit in our building is allocated one parking spot, just one. I park in mine, and my significant other parks his car on the street on the other side of the building. Our parking lot has one visitor space. It's a very small parking lot, six spots for residents and one for a visitor. The visitor spot is nearly always empty and my neighbors have said my significant other could park his car there if he wanted to as we are the only unit with two cars but he doesn't mind parking where he is. This morning my significant other woke up to yelling. Our kitchen window overlooks the parking lot and he snuck a peek out the window and saw entitled neighbors standing next to our nice neighbor's car and they were arguing loudly. She kept yelling that she had a second car and needed to park in his spot and he had to move his car or else she would have it towed. He kept repeating that it was his parking spot and she could either park it in the visitor spot or on the street and if she towed his car, he would report it as stolen. Significant other said she kept yelling that she can park wherever she wants to and he needed to move it or else. So my significant other decided to park his car in my empty spot in case she tried to park there while I'm at work. Last message he sent me, she had stormed upstairs in a huff and slammed the door. Update. I got home from work and she has parked her second car in the visitor spot, but she's parked it so badly it's blocking the driveway in. Right now, I'm parked on the street, but too tired to deal with her. Update 2. So, like I said before, her car was basically blocking the driveway and I had to park on the street. Anyway, when I got up for work the next day, it was still there, but when I came home, it was gone. I asked my significant other as he was at home and apparently a tow truck came and took it away. I'm still not sure which neighbor called the tow truck, but I have a suspicion it's the one she was arguing with. Significant other said she has been quiet all day, only the odd footsteps. Am I the jerk for letting my fiancé fend for himself after he constantly compared me to his mom? My fiancé had a heart attack and required an open heart surgery two weeks ago. He just got home a few days ago and I'm caring for him. A little backstory. His mom and I don't have a good relationship. Since the beginning of my relationship to my fiancé, his mom would constantly try to compete with me and one-up me on everything. She always claimed she should be the first woman in my fiancé's life because she birthed and raised him and how I can't break their bond. For the most part, these comments were unprovoked and at first I would be too scared to defend myself, but later I stood up for myself and my fiancé stood up for me and established some boundaries with his mom. His mom sometimes crosses some of those boundaries but for the most part, she's been acting a bit better. During his stay in the hospital, both I and his mom took turns staying with him. Ever since we got home, I'm the one caring for him 24-7. And I don't mind. I love him and I want him to get better. But I got extremely upset because after we got home, he was being ungrateful about everything. He started comparing me to his mom. He started saying his mom would do this thing better and why can't I do it like his mom does since that's how he likes it. He gave backhanded compliments to the foods I make and says, It's good, but it's not like my mom's. He sometimes also snaps at me because I won't do something quick enough or properly enough and he will tell me words like, I wish my mom was here. She wouldn't be so useless. Just tell her to come here if you can't do these basic tasks. I was patient with him because I don't want to upset him during his recovery. What made me lose my mind and leave the house was when he told me that his mom was probably right when she said she should be the first woman in his life since she'd care about him better than I do and how it was a mistake establishing boundaries with her and that I was the one he should have established boundaries with. After this comment, I didn't think twice. I just packed my clothes in my handbag and left and went and stayed at my cousin's house. He called me and said that I'm the jerk for leaving him home alone while he's recovering and that I should have at least called his mom first so she'd come. I told him he should call her and it's none of my business anymore. My parents told me I was out of line for leaving him to fend for himself 
and that he's right, that I should have called his mom first. And now I'm the jerk for making this about me when my fiancé's recovery should be my priority. Not the jerk. Go back, pack the rest of your stuff, and leave him for good. He's showing his true colors. A mama's boy will always be a mama's boy, and you'll always come second. OP. For all these years, he was an amazing partner who was able to set all the right boundaries to his mom. I don't know what changed now, and he switched that fast. Nothing changed. This is who he is. It's easy to put up boundaries when things are going well. I have sympathy for him in terms of his recovery from surgery, but ultimately, it's difficult circumstances that really test a partner's willingness to maintain said boundaries. If he can go back on his word this time, he'll do it again. Exactly. Sure, the surgery is a huge, emotional, and painful process that can bring out the worst in some people, but it sounds like he has adjusted his true self long enough to lock OP into marriage and kids. Once that happens and OP is tied down, mommy will take over his life again. Yes, open heart surgery takes a psychological toll on the patient. It brings out their true colors. This is his, and it ain't pretty. OP, you need to make that departure permanent. You made a huge sacrifice in being his 24-7 caretaker. Taking care of a post-surgery patient, open heart no less, is deeply and physically and emotionally exhausting. He's being deeply ungrateful. People take turns taking care of patients. You're doing all the care around the clock, and you're also being belittled? That doesn't seem balanced. Comparing you to his mom and belittling what you do for him that way is typical mama's boy antics. Of course it's not like mom's. It's not made by mom. If he wants to do things mom's way, just give her a call, the way he did you after you left. It's clear he doesn't want a life with his partner. He wants mom 2.0 to take care of him. No matter what he did, if he told you that you aren't the first woman in his life because mom has that spot, you need to leave. Yes, mommy raised him, but when he's an engaged man, his life partner takes priority. This is his way of telling you that he will always choose his mom over you and your second no matter the circumstances. Do you want to spend the rest of your life with him? Not the jerk. Also, run. Call off the wedding. He can marry his mom since he doesn't get the difference between wife and mother. OP. Oh, trust me, he gets the difference. He just wanted to switch it to his benefit each time. All these years, his mom was useless to him, so he was perfectly fine setting boundaries with her. Suddenly, he started missing the mommy care and switched me to be the bad guy because I was not an exact copy of his mom. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. If Reddit boy was a mama's boy, he'd need a new head. My parents wanted me to trade houses with them because I got a slightly better one. I'm going to start this off by saying that if you have a house and don't have cameras, get cameras. I have some now, but I should have gotten them sooner. I live in a pretty typical manufactured home in Arizona. My parents also live in one just a few streets over. Despite how close we are, I'm very low contact because they are just bad people. They treated me okay as a kid, but things changed as soon as I was in my late teens. I was expected to do more and pay my way as soon as I finished high school. That was fair. I was an adult by then after all. But my parents wanted a lot more in rent than what I'd have to pay to get my own apartment. I'd have had next to nothing left of my monthly paycheck if I'd given them what they wanted. So I refused to give them more than a fair amount, plus a share in utilities. And I started buying my own food as well. My father openly said that this was not good enough and my parents actually filed official paperwork to evict me when I refused to cater to their demands. I left home and got an apartment with my best friend. Five years later, and I bought my own house in a neighborhood not far from my parents. It's just a manufactured home on a small property, but it was so darn cheap that I couldn't turn it down, and my monthly mortgage isn't bad either. I even moved my best friend in to help me cover the bills. We were already used to living in the same space, and the house gave us much more room. I may even let another friend move in to get some more rent money for the mortgage because we've got one room that's actually left unused right now since the house is a three bedroom. My parents though somehow didn't like my independence from them. Did they want me to fail or something? I don't know. But the incident that caused the very low contact was when they demanded I trade houses with them. Yes, you read that correctly. They actually wanted to trade. Their manufactured home is smaller and older than mine and has one less bedroom. And their yard is smaller too. Not that either of us have any grass. It is Arizona after all. When they first saw my place, they looked upset. 
After a couple more visits, my father actually said it wasn't fair that I was doing better than them, and I was rubbing my nicer house in their faces. It's just an old manufactured home in one of the hottest states in the US. Seriously, what's to brag about? But I guess having something even slightly better than what my parents had irked them. And as I've already said, they actually demanded we trade houses because of it. My friend who lives with me literally fell onto the couch laughing when they said that, and I couldn't help but join in. My father said it was not funny, and to give him what he wants. When I recovered my composure, I said he and my mother were not entitled to my house or anything I own for that matter, and then told them to get out. After that, we barely spoke, and then lockdown hit. Didn't really change my life much. I liked the peace and quiet, and my friend knows to leave me alone most of the time. My father, however, got laid off, and he struggled to find another job. He ended up working in the local Marto Walls for half a year before getting a better paying job. I did get a kick out of seeing him there when I was shopping for groceries, but as much as I hate him, I'm not going to call him a bad employee. He actually did fine. But during that time, he and my mother kept calling me and asking for money. And I know what y'all are thinking. Don't lend them anything. They didn't want loans. They wanted handouts. Why? Because they raised me and I owed them. I said if they didn't want the cost of raising a kid, they shouldn't have had one. A few weeks ago though, my mother called me begging for money because their dinosaur of a window AC unit finally crapped out. I told them I was not giving them anything and they were too cheap to replace the old AC unit for a long time, so I wasn't going to buy them a new one. My mother then complained about how I have two in my house and the least I could do is give them one. I then said that if she and my father weren't always throwing away their money on beer and other stuff all the time, they'd have the money to buy another AC. Then I said I wasn't giving them one of mine or any money. End of story. Only it wasn't the end of the story. A few days later I came home from work, find my house had been broken into. My front door locks were drilled out and both of my window AC units were gone. Nothing else was stolen, but they went out of their way to make a huge mess for some stupid reason. Probably to make it look like a typical robbery or something. I knew it had to have been my parents and I called the police. I told the police that I heavily suspected my parents of the theft because they act entitled to my stuff, even though I'm a grown man that doesn't live with them. I went with the police to my parents' house and sure enough, they had both my AC units going in their windows. When confronted, my parents obviously denied the theft. They claimed they already owned the AC units, but statements from their neighbors say otherwise. But my parents still denied the theft. I'd bought both AC units used online years ago, which means I had no receipts for them. So I figured my only option was to look for witnesses in my own neighborhood. And as luck would have it, a neighbor across the street has security cameras, and the edge of one of them caught just enough to see my parents showing up in my father's truck. My father could be seen walking with a cordless power drill in hand, and a few minutes later, they came back to the truck with my AC units, then went back in to ransack the place I'm guessing. With this evidence in hand, police had cause to arrest my parents. At first, both of them acted like they had done nothing wrong, but I convinced police to let me do the talking. I said they could either return the AC units to my home and clean up the mess they made, or I'd let the police arrest them both right there. They had already stolen from me, lied to the police, trespassed, vandalized my house, broken my front door locks, and there was video evidence of what they had done. If I pressed charges, they were both going to jail for sure. My parents looked deflated, then asked for a moment to talk with each other in their room. I heard a lot of shouting from both of them, and I could hear my mother yelling that my father was an idiot, and he was trying to blame me in turn. After about five minutes of that, they came back out looking even more deflated, and said they'll return the AC units and stop bothering me for money if I didn't press charges. I said they were going to clean up the mess in my house and buy new locks for my front door as well, and then I wanted written apologies from both of them on top of it. They begrudgingly agreed and even got a police escort back to my house. My father was forced to put the AC units back in my windows and then left my mother to clean up the huge mess they made while he went out and bought replacement locks for my front door. He was gone about an hour and came back with a new stainless steel lock set to replace the knob and deadbolt. Then he had to help my mother finish cleaning. During this time, I let the two cops just sit and watch them while drinking soda. They said it was very entertaining. After everything was cleaned up, I gave my parents each a piece of paper and a pencil, then told them to write out apologies to me for what they had done. 
My father looked especially upset and said I was treating him like a kid. I said he was acting like one and never stopped treating me like one either. This was just me holding him accountable and I could have sent him to jail, but I felt like this was better for teaching him a lesson. He then kind of snorted and started writing. My mother wrote out a good apology, but my father's was a pretty half attempt and passive aggressive, but I didn't care. It seemed to really get to him inside having to do it. And when he was done, he left without speaking to me. My mother said she was sorry and she'd leave me alone, then followed after him. The two cops said they thought the whole thing was hilarious and then thanked me for giving them an excuse to take a break while on the job before leaving. Not long after, I shelled out to get some cameras for the exterior of my house. So if someone tries to break in again, I'll get it on video. I only have two cameras, but added a couple more fake ones that look real enough just to scare people off. I haven't heard a peep from my parents, but their next door neighbor told me that they went and bought a new AC unit. Guess they had the money for one after all. Makes me wonder why they thought it was a good idea to steal from me. Maybe having lean pockets for a while will teach them. Then again, they are who they are after all. Edit. I've been questioned on how I got a house when I was only 23 years old. To start off with, the place was very cheap. In Arizona, you can find old manufactured homes on tiny properties for a very doable amount. I also kept and still have pretty good credit. The house and land were only 55k. The house was a little bit of a fixer upper too, but I was able to put 10k on a down payment and I was able to get approved for a loan for the rest. The house is no prize and by now it's at least 30 years old, but it's home and once I have it paid off, I'll feel much more financially secure. Am I the jerk for using my husband's money to pay for my daughter's Apple iPhone that he broke? My daughter is 16. She's had her old phone for five years and always wanted a new phone. I'm the only one working right now since my husband decided to take a break from work after he inherited some money from his dad. I saw that she did pretty good at school despite having mental health issues that had gotten in the way of her focus before and so I decided to keep her encouraged and reward her by getting her an Apple iPhone that cost a good sum of money. I did my best to save money to buy it. I literally skipped paying for breakfast at work to be able to afford it and my husband didn't want to help so I was on my own. I bought her the iPhone and quite honestly, I haven't seen her this happy in a while. It was refreshing for me because she really went through some hard times in the past couple of years emotionally and mentally. My husband wasn't happy with this and he said the iPhone will only distract her from school and chores, but that wasn't true. In fact, it encouraged her to do more. But he still said I shouldn't have spent that kind of money on an iPhone that she might be irresponsible with and break. My daughter picked up on his attitude towards the iPhone, but I told her to ignore him. Days ago, I found out that he broke the iPhone. I asked why, and he said he had asked her to get him something from the toolbox in the garage, but she was on the iPhone and ignored him. He used this incident as evidence that the iPhone was a bad influence, but I yelled at him and demanded he replace it. He said he wouldn't, so I took money out of his account and paid for a new iPhone and gave it to my daughter. He saw what I did and went off on me, calling me names, and accused me of stealing his father's money and demanded the money I took, every single penny back. I basically told him it won't happen. He got his mother on me, saying I'm setting a terrible example for my daughter by getting her a phone paid for with money that I stole from her dad. My husband said he won't speak a word to me until I fix this, but I already said I owe him nothing. Am I the jerk for this? ETA. No, he's her biological father, not stepdad. And price for the iPhone where I live is $1,000 and it's not cheap. Finding out that I took $1,000 out of his inheritance really got him so furious that he said I was the worst woman he met in his life. He had two ex-wives if this is in any way relevant. He took it back later, then said he won't speak until the money is back. Sounds like you need to save up for a divorce. To purposefully break someone's belongings because their actions anger you? This is just a massive red flag. He quit his job because of an inheritance and makes you work extra to get something for your daughter? OP, run like Usain Bolt. You are not the jerk. The fact he's not working but eating up savings is such a hill to die on for me. It's so irresponsible and not thinking about long-term consequences. Then he breaks her phone instead of just taking it away for the day like a normal person? OP, pack up everything you need and leave. Am I the jerk for naming my daughter the same as her half-sister? Last summer, I, 33 female, 
started seeing this guy, 45, male. In December, I found out I was pregnant and I decided to keep it. I was already feeling like we were at the beginning of the end of relationship, so I said, look, I'm pregnant. I've made this decision, but it's up to you if you want to be involved, and it's okay if you want to bail. I have the resources to do this alone. He said a baby wasn't something he wanted, and I said that's totally fine. I won't even put your name down on the birth certificate. We can treat this like a donor situation. He agreed. After that, he predictably started pulling away and we broke up. Three months post breakup, when I was six and a half months pregnant, this woman DMs me and says, hey, were you getting with my husband until recently? It turns out that he had a wife and a daughter. His wife was slash is in the process of getting a divorce from him and gathering evidence of what turned out to be a wild amount of cheating. So she was relatively cordial and believed me when I said I had no clue. Even before we had broken up, I told him that if it was a girl, I wanted to name her Samantha. Samantha isn't the actual name, but it's a similar, long, girly name with multiple nicknames. It was my sister's name before she passed, and even before that, it was a name I loved for aesthetic reasons. We always talked about naming our daughters after one another before she passed. He expressed dislike, but I jokingly, but not really, said it wasn't really his decision. After everything came out in the open, I found out that the reason he was so against the name was because his daughter is named Samantha. Now that everything is out in the open, he said, so what are you going to name her? And I said, what do you mean? I already told you, Samantha. And he said, you can't do that. That's my other daughter's name. I said that he lost naming privileges a long time ago. And if anyone asked, I was happy to make it clear that I had been the one to pick the name. I also reminded him that I still wasn't obligating him to be involved in this in any way. And given how he had lied, I frankly didn't want him to be. But if and when he chose to be involved, I was going to hold him to it and expect child support, visitation, etc. Which, from his point of view, is non-ideal because he doesn't want the responsibility of care and especially doesn't want the responsibility of child support and asset splitting. Rather, he wants to have his cake and eat it too. I take on all the responsibility. There's no paternity test, a blank father's name on the birth certificate, but he still gets to have opinions, which frankly suits me as well because I don't want to be legally tied to him. But when I told my friend, she said that while he didn't deserve any courtesy, it was an unkind thing to do to his daughter. How do you think your daughter is going to feel when she finds out she has an older half-sister with the same name? And she will find out. There are currently around 50 comments, and as far as I can tell, this is the only one that mentions how the OP's future daughter might feel in the future. Surely, that should be one of the first considerations. It seems like that could be covered by, it was my late sister's name, who meant a lot to me, and I chose it before I knew about your donor's other family. Right? Tell her early that she's named after her late aunt, and her half-sister having the same name is a funny coincidence. Assuming the real name is equally as common as Samantha, she's going to know at least a few at school anyway. Well, what do you think? Should OP go ahead and name her daughter Samantha or not? Please let us know. I might get downvoted for this, but I think it's her choice what she wants to name her baby. That deadbeat doesn't have a say in anything. Am I the jerk for letting my husband's ex struggle when I could technically pay? My husband, B, who's 36, and his ex, K, who's 34, share two kids who are ages 16 and 14, split custody 50-50, no monthly child support, but B pays all insurance, medical costs, extracurriculars, and has to put $150 each in a college fund each month. I have a 16-year-old myself. B made a base income, but got bonuses and commissions. On commission checks, he would send K 50% of it. On bonuses, he would send K 35%. This was not court ordered, but very regular. Well, B was in a wreck, couldn't work five months, got fired, legal, called lawyer. Took three months to find another job that could cater to his new disabilities, but took a huge pay cut and no more bonuses or commission. I paid all bills, plus his child obligations, even the average sum of what he sent K extra per month during this time. After realizing his pay wouldn't recover, we talked to K and told her that we can no longer afford to send her extra as we weren't making it. She seemed to understand. During this time period, my kid turned 16 and saved up $4,000 for a car. I've always promised to match whatever they save. This money was already put away. We got a car for 6 k My kid pays her own insurance and gas. B's 16-year-old saw 
and somehow got Kay to lease her a car in fairness. Kay did not consult us about it. The next month, she hits us up for money. After some discussion, she assumed we'd figured out the money after seeing us buy my 16-year-old a car. We explained that's not the case, but she got so angry losing it on us and ended up taking us to court for child support. The court determined that K makes significantly more than B and she needs to pay $300 a month in child support and reimburse insurance. Her past income did not matter since he is now considered disabled. It's been about three months since and Kay's entire family is blowing us up, telling us how horrible and evil we are, that Kay is being threatened with eviction and B's 16-year-old car is being repoed. They say it's my fault because Kay only leased it since she expected us to keep paying, that her paying child support means she can't afford her car and I'm spoiling my 16-year-old playing favorites. Kay also says that my income plays a role since the kids live with me 50% of the time, so I'm horrible to deprive the kids. This makes me feel horrible. Am I the jerk here? I could pay, but I would not be able to save since I'm paying more since B makes way less. Not the jerk. Spouses have nothing to do with financial responsibility of a kid. The biological parents are responsible for child support, point blank. And it's her own darn fault for assuming anything. Honestly, your husband was more than generous before the accident. Like, really? Had it been me, my ex would not have seen any of my bonus or commissions. She did herself over in taking y'all to court. She made her bed, let her lay in it. She sounds very greedy and entitled to me. And y'all are doing 50-50. She's lucky she saw anything. I'm honestly shocked. Not the jerk. No good deed goes unpunished. B should never have been so generous. Of course, that is neither here nor there. Bottom line, this is not your responsibility. This is also none of Kay's family's business. They don't get a vote. Block them. I just love the fact that Kay was losing it on you and taking B to court, and yet she gets stuck paying child support. Wow, nothing like schadenfreude. Disconnect your guilt button. You have nothing to feel guilty about or horrible about. Kay brought this on herself. You should not have to suffer. Am I the jerk for expecting my pregnant girlfriend to apologize to my mom after rejecting her food? My girlfriend is 39 weeks pregnant and my mom has come to town to stay with us so we have someone to take care of our three-year-old and cats when we go to the hospital. My girlfriend and mom usually get along, so it was a good idea, but my girlfriend has been causing some issues this week and now I'm stuck in the middle between two angry ladies and wondering if I'm the jerk. The main issue. My mom is an amazing cook, but admittedly she doesn't always cook the healthiest because growing up, me and my brother hated vegetables. My mom has cooked dinner for us every night since she got here five days ago, and tonight my girlfriend said she would cook. My mom told her not to worry because she already had it planned. So my girlfriend told her that maybe she could cook for herself, our toddler and me, but my girlfriend needed something specific tonight. They kind of went back and forth with my mom offering to cook what she wanted until my girlfriend rather rudely said she just wanted to cook for herself tonight. My mom is extremely offended and hurt and my girlfriend is upset because she says she needs certain nutrients and foods right now and she can't let being polite get in the way of maintaining a healthy diet. I decided to take my mom's side because she offered to cook my girlfriend what she wanted and girlfriend literally ended up just eating boiled green beans and broccoli, which my mom easily could have done. Plus, the baby is already grown and she takes prenatal vitamins every day, so I felt she was being a bit dramatic. I told my girlfriend I expect her to apologize to my mom and she told me I'm being a jerk and need to butt out. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. The baby isn't fully grown, for starters. Babies rely on the energy and nutrients mom provides until they are out of the womb and the cord is cut. Then they get it via milk and formula. Just because she's taking prenatal vitamins doesn't mean it's all good. Secondly, you have zero ideas about the cravings of a pregnant woman. She wanted healthy food, which is her body telling her that's what she needs at that moment in time. Having a baby takes a massive toll on the body. If she wants to cook herself veggies, let her have all the veggies. She clearly tried to be polite to your mother, and then she got snapped. Your girlfriend is full of hormones, emotions, about to give birth, and your baby. Worst of all, you sided with your mother over your girlfriend, aka the mother of your kid. What kind of jerk move is that? Are you looking to sleep on the couch for eternity? You, sir, need to get your priorities in order. Apologize to your girlfriend and ask your mother to chill with the pushiness. Your mother obviously means well, but she needs to stay in her lane and respect your very pregnant girlfriend's wishes when it comes to what she wants to eat. 
Entitled mom demands I invite her kids to a party that's not even a party. So some backstory. My brother is an ER doctor and his husband an ER nurse, so they both work long hours throughout the week. They have twins, we will call them Ann and Ken, not their real names, just the first to pop in my head. Now because of their workload, me and my sister help throughout the week by taking the kids after school a few days a week. I have them on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. Well, Friday happens to be my niece and nephew's birthday. Now due to lockdown, we can't have a big party that they're used to, but I still wanted to make it special. My niece and nephew had become friends with two kids in the building, Sarah and Blake, again fake names. Their mother we will call Nice Neighbor. I had become friends with her. Now every time my niece and nephew are over, they play with Sarah and Blake. So I told the twins that Sarah and Blake could come over on Friday for a little birthday sleepover. I worked it out with Sarah and Blake's mom and got everything ready. Now here's where Entitled Mom comes in. As I was coming in the building, Entitled Mom ran up to me. So, you are having a party tonight? Me. What? No. Sarah and Blake told my kids that they were going to your niece's party at your apartment. Me. It's not a party. It's my niece and nephew's birthday, so I told them they could have Sarah and Blake over to watch movies. Well, my kids are upset that they weren't invited. Me. Sorry, but like I said, it's not a party. Just my niece and nephew having friends over. My kids would love a sleepover. Me. Oh, well then maybe you should throw one. You could be nice and invite them. It's not nice to leave kids out. Me. I don't even know your kids. Sarah and Blake have been friends with my niece and nephew for going on three years. Well, they can always get to know each other at the party. No, my niece doesn't like strange people. I'm your neighbor. I'm not strange. You tried to break into my apartment a few days ago. You're being overly dramatic. And you're being crazy. Well, that's rude. I rolled my eyes and walked away before she could say anything else. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.